far away. Yeah, the, uh, the way um, you explain it, it just seems like you're encouraging the general group to pursue channeling and pursue uh, things that would get us closer to gaining the knowledge we need to follow the divine love path. That, am I reading that right? Or? Yeah, with regard to channeling, though, there are risks, obviously, associated with it. Um, the, the primary risk uh, regarding channel, channeling is that the medium themselves determines the law of attraction as to which spirits will come to speak with them. So if the medium you go to um, is not on the divine love path, then obviously they'll be attracting mostly natural love spirits to speak with you. And then if they're, the medium themselves is not in a good emotional condition, which often they are not, because they often think that because they are mediumistic that they don't need to work on their emotions. And as a result of that, often the mediums themselves are in quite bad condition emotionally and with respect to love, understanding love. And as a result of that, they'll be attracting first fear spirits who will be coming to speak with you. So, um, and of course, a first fear spirit does not know anything beyond the first fear because they've never lived beyond that place. And so, uh, you know, often there, there'll be a lot of misinformation. But a person that is a channeler and recognizes that mm -hmm. um, would probably fare better in their development knowing that there are, there are chances when you're channeling a spirit that can allow spheres. Certainly. Um, it's like, uh, I suppose it's like anything. You're, who you're speaking with determines what kind of reflection of love you're going to get from them and, and what their condition is will definitely reflect that. So while many of, some of you here are mediums and while you have the opportunity to double check everything that's being said to you from other people, uh, you also need to question yourself as to who, who am I actually double checking with, if you like, because a lot of times we're not certain about those kind of things. So it's very much dependent upon your own soul condition as to what you will attract even from spirits. And so therefore it's going to very much determine what the soul condition of the spirit is as to what kind of information you're going to get from them. Yeah. Hearing it, uh, not related to that, but related indirectly. Yeah. Uh, a person who, and this, and I, we kind of felt this last night during the meeting, Okay, at the beginning of the meeting, it was, I kind of felt like everyone was real tired. Maybe because it was Friday, it was the end of the week, people were working all week long with fatigue coming in. Okay, and after about an hour or two, okay, the energy kind of picked up, you know, okay, because they had a chance to rest. Yeah. Okay, and, and when it seems to me that when I'm at my, when I'm fatigued, okay, I'm probably more susceptible to lower level spirits um, getting involved with me. Um, and, and so there is an energetic correlation between how fatigued I am and whether it's good or not good to channel during that time. Yeah, and well there's two things going on. Firstly, I'll, I'll talk about last night secondly, but the first thing regarding fatigue. When you're in a state of fatigue, and this applies to all of you, you are, when you're in a state of fatigue, you are actually in a state where you're more connected with your true emotional condition, believe it or not. Uh, and so for that reason, it's, it's very hard then to use the intellect to get you out of that condition. And that's why um, a lot of times when we're fatigued, we actually act a lot worse in terms of disharmonious with love than we would when we when we had enough sleep and, and had something to eat. <laughs> but when we haven't had enough sleep and we haven't had enough to eat or we haven't had the right food to eat, generally we get all of our emotions start getting triggered in that state emotions that are left within us and so and um, certainly that that means then you are also more susceptible to some negative spirit influence at the same time last night the dynamics of what was happening was that initially with the amount of different spirits that came along with everyone to the group last night the first hour or so there were a lot of very questioning and, and sometimes quite hostile spirits with us last night. Mm -hmm. And that depresses the energy of the group because it's the mixture of the energy of the group and the energy of the spirits that actually determines whether something is positive or not. Once, uh, once I started talking about the Jesus stuff, if I could call it that, and a lot of the spirits who were in that state left and some of the people who were in that state left at the same time. And as a result, 
the ones that were left over here were actually in quite a good positive condition or they were in a condition where they were in the hills and they wanted to know more truth. And in both of those conditions, they weren't, they weren't trying to shut down or suppress truth. More accept. And so they were more accepting. So the energy difference between what was going on last night in those two sort of phases of last night, the first phase was there was this depressing energy trying to shut things down. And you know how sometimes people ask questions, but they're asking questions not to get the answer, but rather to crit criticise? And that, uh, and that spirit was there with a lot of the spirits last night. They all had that kind of spirit where they, they weren't prompting questions for the sake of getting answers. They were prompting questions for the sake of entrapment. And, uh, and once they left, then there was a much more open spirit. And, and, and it's certainly the en energy of the spirits around you, just like people around you, will affect you. So if the, people, if the spirits around you are angry and you're in an angry state, you're going to get more of an angry state through that, through that interaction. Yes. If uh, you're in, a, in a quite a good state emotionally and that, but you're going into a room where everyone else is not so good, good in terms of open and receptive, what will happen is the spirits with them will also not be open and receptive. And so therefore the feeling you have when you walk in the room is, oh, this is a bit hard. You know? And you'll, you'll become more and more sensitive to that as you progress to it. Uh, I would like to ask a question about guilt. So I'm working with guilt issues and it seems like I'm feeling it, but it's returning back and back. <laughs> so I guess I didn't feel it deep enough, but I don't know how to do it at all. Well, um, guilt, guilt could be the result of one of two different things. Um, firstly, guilt can be guilt that is not ours. In other words, it's somebody has uh, impressed it upon us, usually our parents. Um, and if that's the case, then all we need to do is recognise a truth about the guilt and the guilt will actually leave us. If the guilt is ours, then usually it relates to the law of compensation that I was talking to last night, where we have done some things that have damaged other people and we need to go through the process of actually feeling that damage that we've done to other people through our course of action that we chose to do. And that process you'd call the law of compensation, and that's a different type of guilt, if you like. That is a guilt that you need to allow yourself to feel as to why you actually did those actions. So, so let's say, uh, in the first instance, let's say uh, my mother felt guilty all of her life, and whenever there was a sexual conversation, or there's anything sexually discussed, so in other words, she had sexual guilt, let's say. From a very young age, then, I will feel guilty about sexual matters. Now, it's not really my guilt, it's really my mother's. And, and it's something that she has impressed upon me. And so in that case, all I need to do is see the truth is that, firstly, it's my mother's guilt that I'm actually trying to feel. And secondly, it's, uh, it's not an emotion that's necessary because it's, uh, it, you know, it, it's not true. You know, there's no, there's no problems with sexuality from God's perspective, because God created sexuality, so so just because your mum had that viewpoint and pressed that onto you emotionally, it doesn't mean it was true. Once you, once you accept those truths emotionally, then usually the feeling of guilt leaves you. In the second case, if I have done things to harm somebody else, so let's say, um, let's say in the case of sexual guilt, let's say I was a man in a relationship and I cheated on my partner. Now, that's a totally different situation because that is a situation where I am, guilt is going to help me trigger the underlying emotion as to why I actually took the action of treating on my partner, che cheating on my partner. And guilt is a way for us to actually access that underlying emotion. Guilt in both cases is not really an emotion. There's underlying emotions that we're suppressing with guilt generally um, or actions that we've taken that we're not accepting. So fully accepting emotionally. Seems more complicated. <laughs> it is more complicated. And for yourself, you mean? Or, so can you describe the guilt you're feeling? Well, first of all, I have trouble to recognize why do I feel why do I feel guilt? Like because it's my mom or because I did something to somebody. So I have big trouble in, in this recognition. And it's mm -hmm. like I just feel guilty, but I know why. But I feel guilty for everything. Let's say I invite you to go 
somewhere and it's rain starts. And I will feel really guilty that I invite you and it's bad weather, you know, it's rain. So I just like, I go to flowers. And Can you see that guilt is a fear in your case then? It's actually fear. That people will not accept me? Mm -hmm. uh, there's that. There's also a, guilt, a fear that uh, that you'll be judged by by the actions you took. Yes, can be. Yeah. So it's underlying feelings. Yeah, so you need to have a look at the underlying feelings. Like, why are you, you accept people's judgment and why do you feel bad if people judge you and all of those kind of things because that's where your guilt is actually coming from. Guilt is like anger and jealousy and other types of emotions in that they are capping emotions. They're not the actual emotion. So it's just a good idea to break it on small pieces, right, and see what it's... Well, it's triggers guilt in me, right? So what is it? Yeah, what triggers the feeling of guilt? Because because that's the real emotion. Guilt is just the result or the effect. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So you know how you feel guilty about all certain, all different types of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You will actually find there's a common thread between them all when you start looking at your fear mm -hmm. as to what what creates the guilt, which is your fear of some other emotion within you, and it's a fear of you know being misunderstood and, and being, you know, um, a fear that other people will reject you and there's quite a lot of different fears associated mm -hmm. with it in your case. Yeah, as you're talking about it, I can see different layers yeah. on this, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you don't have to feel the guilt. Mm -hmm. The guilt is actually the effect of, the emo of not feeling the emotions underneath. Okay. Just like anger, mm -hmm. you don't have to feel the anger because anger is an emotion that you create in order to avoid other emotions underneath. So you could choose to just go straight into the emotions underneath. But if you don't choose to go straight into the emotions underneath, then the effect will be that you'll need to feel the effect emotion, which is guilt or anger or jealousy or whatever. Uh, many of us have sat under Lulu's teaching. You've probably heard, heard some of us speak, you've heard Mike perhaps speak of Lulu. He always says, when, whenever a feeling comes up, and how does that make you feel? And you go back and you feel the layers. Each feeling leads to another feeling until you can't go back anymore. And, you, and that helps you get to the, uh, I forget the term you use, Cause. The, core, the core issue. Uh, and, and ultimately, that's what you discover is the core issue. If you're willing to peel back the layers and say, and how does that make you feel? How does that make you feel? And just, and just go back one layer at a time. Uh, but it's easy to say, you know, I know that I need to peel. Yeah, I know yeah. I need to peel so what? Yeah, I'm feeling. Yeah. How do I know that I'm really doing it, you know? Yeah. How can I know that I really want deep and work with it? Because, yeah. yeah, I can say, sit whole day alone and say, no, I need to peel, I'm going to peel, right? <laughs> so how can I do it? How really with the stools for me to go into this? Well, all of those capping emotions are really fear-based in the sense that they're a fear of getting to the underlying emotion. Mm -hmm. when, when you no longer are afraid of all of your emotion, you'll find that you'll very rarely experience any of those capping emotions. So once you're no longer afraid, you'll very rarely experience anger. You'll very rarely experience jealousy, if ever. You won't ever experience them, in fact, in time. You won't experience guilt and you won't experience shame and, and quite a lot of other emotions, which are all emotions that are basically based around fear of an underlying issue that you don't want to touch. But Lena, it looks like your fears, okay, everybody has its own definition for fears or oh, oh, whatever. I have mine. But in your case, it, for me, it looks like <coughs> it's a little bit like a lack of communication because you fear that another people will think something. If you will just tell them what you feel a little bit uncomfortable with, it will be dissipated, you know, in, in your case, if I'm wrong. No, I, I, yeah. no, I will try it. It, it, yeah. It's just a lack of communication. You, you're afraid that somebody will think something big. I'm not afraid, I just feel good. It's not afraid. <laughs> it's, yeah, no, it's not afraid. You, you, can, uh, you can be very truthful about it. You, you can say to them in that situation, so let's say you invited somebody, like you said, to, mm -hmm. to a picnic and it starts to rain. Yeah. And you feel responsible for that. Yeah, obviously. because they are speak their time. And obviously you're not responsible for it, but you believe you are somehow. Yeah. Um, so you could say straight to them, look, I'm really feeling like I'm responsible for it raining. I know that sounds crazy. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you, and that will actually help you 
it, speaking the truth to yourself will help you out access the underlying fears and help you out access the underlying emotions. The key for you is to just live in truth. You know, most of the time, most of us struggle with just being open and truthful. Don't mean, like, like, how do you really feel today? Oh, I'm good. But, I know, I know. But are you really good today? You know what I mean? Like, what, what is the real feeling? And there's a feeling that we often have within us that nobody really wants to know our real feelings. And one thing that we're going to have to get used to on the Divine Love part is to state your real feelings even if you feel everyone around you don't, doesn't want to know them. Um, in other words, you're going to have to get used to living truth and actually being exactly what you feel right at any one moment. And that takes a bit of practice initially because what's actually happening is you're actually confronting the emotion of trying to please others. And once you confront that emotion and release that emotion of all the reasons why you've tried to please others in the past, you'll find that you'll get to the state where you can just be yourself at any one time and feel relaxed in every situation. So would you say if I really feel something inside of me but I don't want to express it to other people, I know that I feel it but I don't want to show them, yeah. I create a conflict. That's right. right. Okay. And, and you've got to look at super sincerely why you don't want to express it to the other person. Usually it will be because you're afraid of their reaction or their response. You're afraid of losing them as a friend. You're afraid of, you know, look at all those fears because underneath all of those fears are a whole group of emotions. Well, normal, I don't want to bother them with my stuff. All right, so, yeah. so you don't feel your worth bothering them with your stuff. Yeah. So that's another emotion. Does that make sense? <laughs> no, an emotion of unworthiness when you're with others. So, so if you go into them, you'll find that you'll be able to access lots and lots of different emotions by just going into these little things that occur, even tiny little events that occur in a single day. You, you'll find sometimes there's quite large emotions. If I can give you an illustration, that there was a lady that I knew that every time she hopped in the car, she just flicked down the mirror, looked at herself in the mirror and flicked back up the mirror. You know the visor mirror yeah. that's right in front of it? Yeah. And Every single moment she hopped in the car, she did that. So she could spend an hour in front of the mirror doing her makeup and everything else, and she'd walk out into the car, and the first thing she would do is <laughs> flip down the mirror in the car and flip it back up again. Now that sounds like a really innocent action. But once we started talking about it, she finished up screaming at me right? in her anger about me bringing up this tiny little action that there is an emotion underneath it. And after she finished up screaming at me, she went into this really big crying, gut-wrenching crying session, which lasted nearly an hour. And she connected with what was actually going on. When she was very little, her mother told her that no matter how good she looked on the outside, it was on the inside that counted. And the implication from her mother was that she was never going to look good on the inside. And that's how she felt. She felt in the inside of her, she felt that she never looked good even though she's a pretty woman. She never looked good. That's how she felt on the inside. And just that flicking down of the visor and flicking it back up again, it was a way of accessing that emotion. Well, I, I, I've learned tricks along my long journey and something really pops up because you, when someone asks me, how are you feeling, Joseph? Well, you have about 10 minutes. I'm going to tell you how I really feel. No, no, I really don't have time. <laughs> so the best <laughs> so, But that's actually a, a method of me refusing it. The main reason why I ask people now how they feel is because I know how they feel already. Oh, yeah. Because I can feel it from them. Uh -huh. But I know that they don't know how they feel. Mm -hmm. So um, I find it's really good to actually help a person to connect with how they're actually feeling at any one time, just by asking that question. But we're so used to just saying, oh, great. Yeah. And and straight away, some of you would have heard me say, well, no, I didn't want to lie. I wanted the truth. <laughs> 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 if you want to tell me a lie, that's OK. Sometimes I'm talking to somebody, and like, I'm, how are you doing? And I see this person does do really good. But they're like, ah, oh, it's fine. It's OK. So is it good, like, as, can you talk about real feelings? Yeah, yeah. Be, be truthful with everyone around you. If you know that they're not being truthful with you, just ask them all, you know, just say to them, look, I would like to know you properly, not just know the facade, you know. 
So I know that there's something going wrong with you, and if, if you want to talk about it, I'm here to talk about it with them. Um, if you don't, well, that's okay, that's your, your call. But, um, you know, just present to them that you do feel quite different than what they've just said to you. And that may help them just open up and connect to their own emotions. On, this, on the subject of, uh, of having faith in God, okay. I kind of evolved in that one, you know, because you, you're going through peeling the onion, and at, at the very beginning of the peel of the onion, you know, you're, you're kind of feeling insecure and kind of tender, okay, and then when you get to the other side of it, it feels a whole lot better, but then another issue comes up later that causes you to feel like you're pulling back again, but it kind of feels like that sometimes. I had a situation where um, I was I was in and out of jobs, okay, and um, and I got to a place where I lost the job, okay, and I would and my savings would deplete as I was finding the next job. But just before I ran out, I could find that other job again, okay. So my final evolvement uh, is that everything you know, we're living in an absolute uh, safe playground on this planet, you know. Okay, to, to do this emotional work, okay? But it just, it sucks sometimes, <laughs> it really does. You know, because you're really not sure, you gotta see it through it on the other side, you know? And uh, so it's, um, if, if you could paint a, uh, if you could define faith in a sentence, okay, and, 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 and if, if it's Bible, if it's a Bible phrase, go with a Bible phrase, but how would you define what faith, faith in God is? Uh, I feel there's a difference between faith and knowing. Uh, and faith is a step before knowing. Uh, and I think I like Paul's definition in the Bible, actually, that faith is the assured expectation of the things hoped for. In other words, you have an idea or a vision of what will happen in the future, and you hope that that particular vision will occur, and you have a strong desire for that vision to occur, and you feel at some point in the future it will occur. Um, and that, that would be faith. But that faith actually, once you get to a condition of alignment with God, faith changes into knowing. Now, perhaps I can illustrate it a different way. You know that this wall is energy, and you know that your body is energy. So theoretically, you should be able to manipulate the energy in some way so that you can walk through that wall. Theoretically. And many of you may feel that at some point in the future you will be able to do that. Right? But how many of you have done it? Well, the Superman, I could go through that. <laughs> no problem. Without destroying it. Without, oh, well, that's, that's <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, so, how many of you have actually done the go walk through the wall? None of you? Have you? No, of course not. <laughs> Did you in the first century, were you able to do that? No. No. But theoretically, it's possible, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So, right at this moment, you could say that we all have faith that it's possible. But the, at the moment that one of you do it, will be the moment that you now no longer have faith. Now it's reality. Yeah. And faith is what leads you to reality. So it's a, it's a stepping stone. Trust. Um, yeah, trust is a, a little different in that trust, I believe, is actually a state that you're in right now. Whereas faith is more about the future. Like faith is about, about future trust, if you like. Whereas I feel like trust is about what's actually happening right now. Do you trust God right now? If you trusted God fully right now, where would you be, you think? Be able to walk through the wall. Yeah, you'd be able to do those things if we trusted God fully right now. So obviously we don't trust right now either. And trust a lot of times is damaged right from a very, very young age. You look at a, a person like... Ch Luca's age, three years of age, they obviously have a lot more trust in what's going on around them. They don't even consider anything could go wrong, mm -hmm. do they? And it's only as we grow up that we uh, start you know, considering that maybe lots of things can go wrong. And obviously they do through the law of attraction based on the injuries that are within our soul. A lot of things do go wrong. What we perceive to be wrong, in reality what's happening is that our souls are just being triggered with these emotions. And if we allow ourselves to work through that, we'll see how beautiful everything was. But we don't even trust that. So every event that happens to you, 
trust that you created. Would you say hope comes before trust? You hope that you can trust? Maybe where does hope fit in this? Um, yeah, I think all of these qualities are uh, all unique in some way. Like hope, hope is definitely more about a, few, a future thing that you're, you're wanting to achieve or wanting to be in, a, in terms of a state. Uh, whereas trust, I believe, is something that is right, is what is happening right now. Do I trust right now or not? Hope is something to do, a lot to do with the future. And uh, if we have no hope, in other words, we feel hopeless, that is a very, very soul-destroying place to be. Because you can't even see it. You can't even yeah. start hoping or you know, That's right. Wondering. And there's a lot of people in the world today who feel hopeless about love. And there's a lot of people in the spirit world too, by the way, who feel very hopeless about love too. And uh, because they feel in, so there's been so many negative things that have happened in their life in the past that uh, their whole viewpoints of love, if you like, have been devastated. And they don't believe there's any way out of that. And uh, that's a terrible place to be, actually. When you lose hope, you lose a lot of uh, things uh, that are worth living for as well. Yeah, you, you have no life, it's like you're nowhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's sort of like the anxiety of thinking that you're going to recreate what happened in the past and the right. future. And, right. and it becomes hopeless because all you can really see is the past. That's right. And you're projecting it into the future. Yeah. That's right. That's why it's so important to really allow yourself to deal with your emotions from the past because they affect you so much about what you perceive the future to be and even what you perceive your life right now to be. Can we go back to um, feelings? This morning or this afternoon when you arrived, you said, how's everybody feeling? And I know that I responded wonderful. Yeah. And I really felt wonderful because there were so many things that I'm grateful for that have happened. Is I didn't think of grateful over the past few days. I mean, so, so many. And like George and I went right home and we both slept till 9.30 this morning. I mean, that, you know, so physically I felt wonderful too. And then when as you start talking, I was thinking, no. Yes, I feel wonderful. Yes, I feel grateful. I feel relief. Last night was extremely helpful answering things. I didn't even need to ask them the questions. That was so I feel grateful for that. And then there's the sadness about you all leaving. <laughs> and I brought and so there was a whole lot of things. There's a whole lot going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And can I ask you this? I, you know, I sent a note to Nat, and I heard back from her. And I sent her a note this morning. And I'm just hoping, like, I know you go to Texas for a long time. I know you go to Barbados for a longer time. That you might entertain the possibility <laughs> that you could. But I don't. You know, I stay with us longer next time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the law of attraction will bring him here. <laughs> you know, so you might say that. So could you address? I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry. No, you, that can, all, you can feel what you're feeling. That all these, but I, my response was really legitimate when I said it because I was. Yeah. So happy, but then there's all these other things. So I'm sure they're happening all the time with all of us. That's right. Yeah, a lot of times we have a group of things going on at the same time, and you'll get to the point where you won't filter out one above the other. So I just won't feel you won't filter out one above the other. So what you're doing now is wonderful. Because on one hand you're feeling the emotion, there's some positive emotions and joyous emotions, and on the other hand you're feeling also some of the sorrow, which is a fear of loss actually. So you're feeling some feelings of loss as well, which actually connect to your childhood about loss. True. Yeah. So if you if you can allow yourself to go into those, 
So don't, at any one time, what, what we often do is we get happy mm -hmm. and then we decide that we want to stay happy. <laughs> <laughs> because happy feels good at the moment, right? But, and that's what we use then to suppress the underlying stuff. And, and so we've got to be very careful of just allowing whatever to come through all the time rather than trying to stay in a state uh, for a long period of time. Just to let yourself, let every emotion flow through you. Because in the end, what will happen is all those emotions that have connected to childhood events will release all of those childhood events. And in the end, the only emotions you'll feel will be joyous and happy and you won't feel a sense of loss. And you won't feel like you're going to lose anything if AJ doesn't stick around for another week or, or something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So all that's happening is that you're just connecting with some childhood emotions that in the past you've been avoiding, that's all. And the fear of loss, the loss that's within you and suppressing that, you've spent a lot of your life suppressing that. Probably, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Yes. And yeah. I mean, you know, I'm aware of it, but right. Yeah. So let yourself feel those feelings of loss. Are you inviting me to feel them now? You can feel them anytime you wish. Well, I know. I you were encouraging you. And plus, you can develop a little different approach to what I developed for myself. If you was in the presence of the person, you felt the energy, and you became indefinitely connected on an energetic level. That's right. Even if this person is physically in a different location. That's right. Don't forget about that. Mm -hmm. That's right. I know that intellectually. Yeah, but you won't feel that emotionally while you have the feeling of loss in you. So you, you, can, you can reason yourself out of any emotion. You really can. And, and suppress it for quite some time. The way you reason yourself out of emotion is you tell yourself the truth before you feel the truth. Remember, errors are felt and truth is felt, not thought, right? But what we often do is we get in the trap of thinking truth and then that gets us out of the emotional error that we're currently in. So we tell ourselves things like, oh that'll be alright, really you don't need to worry about that, the chances of something going wrong in that situation are not, uh, you know, are not very high. When inside of us we think we're screaming, something's going to go wrong, something's going to go wrong, <laughs> you know, and, like, and we're trying to just suppress that emotion. The key is to just dive into the emotion. Forget the mental gymnastics and just dive into the emotion. Let yourself feel what you really feel. And when that feeling of loss leaves you, automatically the result will be that you will feel connected to everyone around you, whether they're with you or not. You don't have to manufacture that condition with your mind. Right? When, you, when the emotion leaves you, then that condition will be without being manufactured by your mind. Uh, I wanted to shake your hand. I've got to leave because I've got to go to work. And it's really kind of, uh, kind of cool that you're here because, I don't know, within the last month, month and a half, I've asked, I've asked diligently for our paths to cross. <laughs> and, uh, but I'd, I'd rather hug you if I can. I, I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just speak here. I've got the wings. I'm running out of time. It's just a good one. It's 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 Email right. me back. Okay, I didn't answer. Okay. Uh, email me because back. Because I didn't recognize the address. God bless everybody. Don't See you later. It's very oh, nice to meet you. God bless you. Yeah. Love you, Mike. Hi. Can you please a little bit tell us about how, uh, let's say, first level, maybe not the lowest, but a little bit higher levels, how we look, the, how we feel. How we have relationship with our friends or whatever, how we walk, do we need to eat or whatever. You may be <laughs> I'm an engineer, I'm an engineer, I'm sorry. But I would like to uh, hear a little bit, or maybe if it will be possible, a couple of words about a little bit higher levels, if it will be possible. Yeah, sure. Um, 
a lot of times we've been talking about the first view and what's been going on in the first view or what does happen in the first view of the spirit world. But let's go to, say, the second sphere. In the second sphere, your body will look around, depending on what emotions you're... you're if, but let's say you came from the earth and you died of old age. By the second sphere, your body will look around sort of 35 or 40. That's, uh, that's good. You'll, you'll, you'll look pretty fit. Like, so you won't have all this, any flab sort of sitting off here at all. And everyone you walk past will also look pretty much the same. Um, you'll actually, the way you eat will be more sort of smelling than eating. So it's all about the aroma entering your, your spirit body. Um, you will drink uh, water, but not, not in the same manner through your mouth or anything like that, but you'll feel yourself absorb it. So, the spirits call it drinking water and eating food, um, although it's a bit different. The surroundings in the second sphere are, are more beautiful than the most beautiful place you can get here on Earth. So, so if you can think of the most beautiful place that you'd love to live on Earth, or in the second sphere, that's around about, and just a touch better than that will be where you'll be living there. Your house, you will have a house. Um, your house will be a reflection of your life as you've lived it up until that point. And in fact, right now, if, you, if your condition right now is, say, in the second sphere of the spirit world, right now you have a house there already. And your soul created it as a part of its progression. And that house is also a reflection of your life as you're living it right now. So the instant you pass, somebody will actually introduce you to the house that you've created in the location that you've created. And they may take a bit of time before they introduce you because they might want to introduce you to a number of other things first before they take you home, if you like. But that home will be a creation of your own, of your own soul. Nobody else will have created that home for you. Um, the homes in the second sphere look a bit better than the homes here, like the best kind of homes you get here, but they are a reflection of what your desire is. So if you've always desired a lovely log cabin on the side of a hill overlooking a lake and you'll find that uh, in the second sphere there's a pretty high likelihood that you'll be, go to your home that happens to be a lovely log cabin overlooking a lake. <laughs> right. you find, though, you'll find though that as you progress your desires are change and they also become more powerful. And also your concepts change. So, so what you believed you'd like in the second mm -hmm. sphere by the time you get to the third sphere, you're starting to think that it's not as important as you were previously considering it to be. And so your desires change and the, the home that you then have in the third sphere would be being created for you while you're in the second sphere. And that home would be a reflection of your new desires and your new longings that you're, you're actually generating within yourself. Animals are all there as well in the spirit world, so whatever animals uh, that you enjoy, you probably want to surround yourself with those. You can also visit locations, so there are cities. Um, they are all much more harmoniously governed than the cities <laughs> that you have here, <laughs> which is good. And there is also work to do, but not in the sense that most people consider it. Um, so there's not, there's not this, you will want to grow like in the third sphere, for example, many people are growing gardens, for example, learning, they're learning how to actually create a plant and then have God's life force enter that plant so that now the plant is a growing thing. So they, they're learning how to actually manipulate matter to, to grow things by the time they reach the third sphere, generally. And in the third sphere, you've got some interesting choices. Uh, you can remain on the natural love path uh, if you desire, or you can actually find out things about the divine love path in the third sphere. And there are certain things in the third sphere that you find out about on the divine love path that you can't find out about in any other sphere. So in other words, if you're on the natural love path and you've progressed to the sixth sphere, and then all of a sudden you decide you want to go on the divine love path, many times you'll have to go back to the third sphere in order to uh, investigate those things that you didn't investigate the first time that you passed through the third sphere. Your homes in each sphere grow in grandeur, generally. Uh, but it depends a bit on you know, what the desires of your soul are. 
so so if your desire is to have this fantastic place, then obviously you will. But if your desire is to live in the bush and yeah. and just have a you know just have something that's really natural, then that your desire will be fulfilled in that regard as well. So by the time you get to the sixth sphere, any desire you actually have can be fulfilled and created. And that means that any desire that is also um, that you want to, anything you want to believe, you can also create as long as it's in harmony with natural love. So there's literally billions of spirits in the sixth sphere who believe they're on the planet Orion and they believe that they, you know, communicate in certain ways, and they do. But they don't know the full truth of what's happening around them. They only know what they believe, but they're in the state of love where their love is being perfected. And so the third sphere is a place, so the second sphere is a place where you start to look good. The third sphere, obviously, from there on, you're starting to look better as you grow, and growing younger. By the time you reach the seventh, you'll be looking around 25 years of age, and uh, your body will be looking pretty shapely, thank you very much, and you won't notice it. <laughs> That's the other thing. <laughs> Whereas, here you notice it, but because there's not too many people who are, who are hundreds of years old in that, in that shape, right? But in the spirit world, you don't notice it because everybody else in the same location is the same. So, so it's not. So the things you think you'd notice here, when you pass over there, they sort of become old hat sort of thing, and uh, they just become what you naturally assume to be the case. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so as your desires change, when you look back on the desires you had, they will seem quite sort of meaningless almost in many cases because your new desires seem so powerful. And every time you grow into a new state of love and into another new state of love and into a new state of love, you'll find that these desires will continue to change. So how many of you love partying, you know, going out every Saturday night, getting drunk, partying, whatever, all that stuff, right? Now some of you probably in the past really enjoyed that, right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, why isn't it that, that attractive anymore? Part of the reason is because society looks down on that, okay? But, um, but if you don't care about that, <laughs> Florida's a great place to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't most people finish up doing it forever? Yeah, I guess there are people that do. Yeah, not Yeah, exactly. What, what eventually happens is that you're not, you're not getting certain emotions within you fulfilled like you thought you were. And so then you decide, well, there must be other ways to fulfill these particular desires. And it's very, very similar in the spirit world. You, when you go through these different spheres, you get to the sphere and it's just an awesome wonder, right? But after some years, and sometimes after a hundred years, and it might be for some spirits it's after a thousand years, they decide, no, this is now getting a bit old. How do I want to see what else is out there? And that's what causes them to desire to seek further in many cases. There has been spirits in the sixth sphere who have been there for 35,000 years or longer in that one place. And it's a place where you can create so many things that you can be so absorbed in creating these things that you start, that it's only after a long time, many thousands of years, that you start realizing that all you're doing is the same thing over and over again with different subjects. And once you get to realize that, then you, and you allow yourself to feel that that dissatisfaction within. That's when you usually start investigating, well, how do I go to the seventh sphere? And that involves the divine love path. You can only get to the seventh sphere uh, through the divine love path, through connecting with God. So there's many spirits in the sixth sphere who think they're connected to God. But in reality, they're not. They are connected to God from an intellectual perspective, but they don't yet know how to exercise that connection emotionally. I live in libraries and books. I love books. Yeah. Lots of books. Yeah, well, like the pageant messages do describe many of the spheres. So the, the, um, the Judas messages, the Hans Radix channel, uh, describe a lot of the spheres up to the seventh and what you'll experience there. The, uh, if you want to know more about the hills or wander in the spirit lands, there's a book that actually describes a lot more about you know, what kind of experiences are occurring there for spirits. Um, another book uh, written by, I think it's, uh, is it Jane Sherwood? Um, uh, Postmortem Journal, I don't know if any of you have heard that one. Um, 
it's a book about the passing of Lawrence of Arabia and his own personal experience, channeled material through this lady called Jane Sherwood. It's a really interesting book. It just, the first seven or eight chapters describes his experiences as he was going through the hells and his experiences of awakening spiritually. And so, so there's lots and lots of books you can read about all sorts of all sorts of uh, uh, experiences right the way up through the sixth and the seventh sphere. It's very very hard for you to understand anything above the seventh sphere until you've received a lot of divine love. Uh, very very difficult to understand what's going on above that. Can you give us a title on that? Could you uh, which one? The Lawrence Arabian one. Uh, yes, called Post Mortem Journal. And I think the lady who channeled it is called Jane Sherwood. And where do you get them? Um, I got a copy from the US, so so there, there is certainly copies In bookstores? here. bookstores? Uh, the best thing to do is do a search on the net, maybe right, Amazon or something, and, and just see where you can find it there. It's not popularly produced that book, no. so um, it's uh, it's not as widely uh, available as, as some other books are. A Wander in the Spirit Lands, and there are quite a few others like Spirit World and a few other books like that are all on the CDs that I've left with Mike that are on the corner there. So they're under the section Natural Love, and the pageant messages, the, the complete pageant messages are also in there under the section under Divine Love. What about a book about maybe your relationship with God and what he's taught, taught you personally? Is there anything written about that? Um, you mean you mean me personally or oh, you? Yeah. Oh yeah. Our, well, Have you read the book? <laughs> you, you've, I haven't been there so you've been to the 22nd level and yeah. I guess at that point there's a relationship more personal or more, I don't know what I want to call it, you know, is there anything about how that relationship looks? No. Um, the reason why there's nothing being written, there is things written on in the spirit world, yes, but not here on earth. Um, there will be things written here on earth, um, but, uh, but the things that, what, what we're hoping to achieve actually is that many of the things that are written in the spirit world will be just transcribed here on earth. And so, so you'll have a complete like, section of books which are all basically uh, books that were first created in the spirit world, and and they then you you'll be able to read them on, here on earth. But there's nothing like that right now. Nothing like that right now. The the uh, other issue that everyone faces though with regard to reading books is uh, unless you've reached a certain development emotionally, there are certain things in these books that you think you understand but don't yet understand. Uh, for example, how many of you have read the uh, Robert James Lee's series of books, like Through the Mist, Gate of Heaven, Life Elysium? Re I really recommend reading those three, actually. They're very, very good books. Through the Mists is a description of the spirits, of a spirit's passing into the spirit world. Uh, and then his introduction to, to the spirit world, if you like. The, the Life Elysium is, a, is the next series in the book. So it, was a, it was channeled seven years later. And it's a it's a channeling about his life, you know, as he's growing in the spirit world and some of these experiences that he had. And then the gate of heaven describes the experience of entering at one moment with God through the eyes of the spirit, through the in the spirit world, entering entering that state in the spirit world. And so I'd really recommend those three books. They were they were channeled a hundred years ago by by a man called Robert James Lees. And they are also on the CDs that I've left with, with Mike as well. Um, and that's under the section Divine Love. In those books, um, they describe a lot of his experiences as he was experiencing these transitional phases. And you start seeing that it's not as clearly defined as what you may initially conceive of when I draw the spheres. The, the truth is that it, all development is still emotional. And as this man was progressing emotionally and working through different emotions that he had, he was actually progressing also through the spheres without, without really knowing he was doing it. And he got to the seventh sphere 31 years after his passing and, uh, and made the transition into the first celestial sphere at that time. 
and the the channeled material is really wonderful material though and you will find though that if you say if you yourself are say in a second sphere condition when you read the material there's a lot of it that will just go over yeah. your head and and when I say over your head I mean probably over your heart it's probably a better yeah. way of putting it because you won't resonate with it at the heart level then when you go into the third sphere and you feel changes within yourself you will notice that when you read read it that there was well, it's like almost like rereading a new book yeah. you know and and you reread it again and all of a sudden there was all these things that stand out to you that never stood out before and then when you when you progress even further you can reread it again i've actually reread them 12 times those books <laughs> uh, and every single time i've uh, enjoyed it's a new book every time. Yeah, it's a new book every time. Basically, I've enjoyed his experiences as I've as I've been actually re-experiencing all of them as myself. How can you not know if you're going from one level to the next when I think you said previously that you can actually choose when to go? Um, I haven't said that you can choose when to go in the sense of I can't I can't just go. Oh, I'm going to go to the second sphere, and off I go. It's not like that. Because the second sphere condition is a condition of love that is higher than the first sphere condition. And love is something that has to come from the heart. It has to be real. So you can't manufacture that intellectually. It's actually a condition that occurs within your soul. So the only two ways to grow your love are either to grow your love coming from you, which is the natural love path, it means growing in your morality, if you like, or growing on the divine love path, which includes morality, but also receiving God's love into your soul. They are the only two ways that you can actually move from one sphere to another sphere. You can choose to go back at any time you want. The instant you decide to be at a location anywhere else in the spirit world, as long as that location is the same as or less than your own condition, you will be able to go to that location. But you cannot choose in the same way to go higher in location. The only way to go higher in location in turn, is, is because it's all the development in love. So the only way to go into a higher location is to actually change in your heart. And that takes a lot more effort than just going, oh, I want to go there. Mm -hmm. and you go there. So there's lots and lots of spirits actually that are spending huge amounts of time trying to work out how to get to the seventh sphere from the sixth sphere. And they're not listening to a word of what the people in the seventh sphere are saying. Mm -hmm. They're trying to get there another way. They're trying to get there using their intellect and, and a number of other ways. And they can't do it. And they've been trying for thousands of years, many of them. Mm -hmm. Are they enjoying all this trying? Maybe no, no, some of them are not. They're getting to the point of frustration. Oh. Do you, uh, do you, are there any plans over the next year to put any of your teachings like on something like YouTube or maybe your own website or, um, in other words, a lot of the stuff that you're regurgitating each and every time you visit someplace, you know, might not be a bad idea to kind of just have a place where that's always there and point, you know, you can go over there and get that, you know. What I'm waiting for, Dominic, is for people to use their own feelings and just do what they feel they want to do. I don't. I don't want to get uh, into the state of where I own any material. You know how a lot of, a lot of what's happening with a lot of people who are teaching spiritual things mm -hmm. is that they get into this state of ownership where they feel they own the material, they copyright their material, they right. you know earn money from their material and all of those kind of things. And none of that is what I want to do. Yeah. So so you know Michael, for example, has been taping these sessions and then putting on to DVDs and giving them out to people. That's the kind of thing that I actually would rather see than than my pushing things. Uh, just the Lord, I, I'm just letting the law of attraction yeah. <laughs> work yeah. perfectly to, to yeah. attract the right people. But it kind of isn't it more efficient though to do it on a website? I mean, you don't have to charge for it, okay? But it would seem to me that Mike wouldn't have to go through the trouble of having to burn all these discs if we were always on the web. Because most people have, and here again, hey, there is there are people that don't have computers where that would be very handy, you know. But, but, uh, but well, well, you do have a website, right? yeah. not you. I mean, you don't maintain it, but where some of these materials are available even for free, and it's and it's divine truth. That or 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 yeah. But do you maintain maintain the no, stuff that goes in there, or how does it get put in there? I don't know. 
<laughs> Honestly, just a thought. Yeah, see, see, one thing most of you are probably not understanding at this point is how powerful the law of attraction is. And, and my, my feelings are that I want any person that's involved with what's going on with re surrounding what I'm teaching, I want them to be motivated by their pure desire. When they do that, I can, uh, there's plenty of jobs to do. There's plenty of things to do. For example, every single spirit uh, mediumship session that I've done with Natalie, um, we've recorded, generally. And they all could be transcribed. It just needs a person to do it. Does that make sense? And there has been people volunteering to do it, but then they get a bit upset because they, you know, they're worried about the rewards and you know, they're not getting paid and all those kind of things. And so, you know, I'm just waiting until people understand that there's more involved than the money and, there's, and, and that their law of attraction can attract those particular things. Does that make sense? So I am not concerned about advertising for the reason why no, not advertising. No. Just get the information around quickly. Now, but see, but see, what's the point of giving information to a person who's not ready to receive it yet? Well, that can happen though with a disc as well. I agree, but it, usually if the person's asked for it, they're in the state of readiness to receive it. It's a full-time job to maintain a website like that. And eventually yeah, there will be people who couple will be people doing to do that, not yeah. just one. It's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of effort. Yeah, and, and in, the, in time there will be people doing that because they really, really want to do that and that will be their passion and their desire. But I don't want anybody doing it because it's not their passion and I also don't want to pay somebody to do it because in my opinion, I'm giving the truth to everyone for free, then it's time that everyone who listens to this truth and also puts it in practice needs to learn how to give it for free as well. And in the end, when we all do that, the whole world will be so used to receiving truth for free, which will be wonderful. Right? But at the moment, we're so focused on money, right? Yeah. We're so focused it's on changing. how to make a living and all that kind changing. of stuff. Right? It is changing. But, yeah. Can I give you an example? Can I give you an example? Go ahead. Hi. There was a, that's actually kind of what I always thought it would sort of be like. Do you remember there was a movie called What Dreams May Come? You yep. never oh, seen I it? Just, it. To me, I, I really always thought that that what was what heaven was going to be. Yeah. That house that person built was his wife's painting. Yeah. It was their dream retirement. You had to see the movie, but it was the most awesome movie. Yeah. Yes, it was. I have like three copies of that movie. <laughs> but, and when my ex-husband got cancer, he couldn't watch it. He was afraid. Anyways, I don't. I never believed in the double part of it personally. Just didn't choose that. But the, but the part that they were connected as souls. You know what I mean? Him and his wife, and it made her cry when he came near her. She could feel him. Is that kind of? what you were describing, because to me, when you did that, that was the picture that came to my mind, was that kind of movie, that kind of path. It was a connection, it was a space, and, and it was all created, and like the reason his kids couldn't be themselves was because they didn't think that he respected them enough to listen to them. You know what I mean? Until he got like further developed, and then he could, they could admit that they were his children. You know what I'm yeah, trying to, it was, yeah. that to me that was the most awesome movie of what God, it didn't even show God, of what heaven and what you would create when you die was like. Is it, is it similar to that? And there are a lot of truths in that movie. Um, even, the, even the depictions of what they called the hells were actually quite true. There are actually places that look very, very similar to that in the spirit world. So it has a lot of truth. There are, there were also though uh, quite a number of errors in the movie. Well, I mean, it was a movie. Yeah. Robin Williams made a movie, so I mean, you know. But I, but I'm just saying, to me, for some reason, that struck a chord that that was real. I mean, that there was something really honest about it, the yeah. way that that really was. Yeah. And somebody said, well, that isn't what it. I said, I don't really kind of think that that would be what it would be like. Then yeah. you no, it pick is your own. Yeah. It is very similar that whatever you desire is what you create. But it has to be a pure desire and it has to be right. a desire not, not uh, tainted by emotions. Because it's, it's like, <coughs> your desires right now are a mixture of emotions that are disharmonious with love. Mm 
and the emotions that are harmonious with both. Right. You can't manufacture out, out of yourself the ones disharmonious with love. Okay. The only way to get them out of yourself is to experience them and release them. So, see, a lot of people believe from watching movies like that that they can actually use their desire to create what their best picture is of what they want. And that's what they will arrive into in the spirit world. But that's actually not the case. What the truth is, is that your soul condition at this moment determines where you will arrive at the spirit world. What and, you believe, right? And it's not just what you believe, no. It's actually what you emotionally feel within you as well. Well, that's what I mean. It, what, it, what's, what's inside you at this space. Yeah, but don't, don't confuse beliefs with emotions. They are both, uh, beliefs are certainly emotions. But emotions aren't necessarily beliefs. Uh, to give you to give you an eye, uh, an idea of what I mean by that, um, let's say I might have a belief. I might be a Christian, right? And I have a belief that when I die, I'll be with Jesus in heaven. That's my belief, right? When I pass, that belief will not be realised. And I can guarantee you, you will not be realised. <laughs> yeah. Right? Because you. Just because you believe it, it doesn't mean it's, it's true. And also, let's say, as a Christian, I'm also having a feeling inside of myself that every person who's not of my faith is condemned to hell by God. Let's say that's a belief I also have. Right? When I pass, I will actually find that my belief has actually created a hell for me. I can believe that. Right? Now... Now, I might intellectually think all I like that I'm going to pass into heaven and be in this nice, pretty place. And I might believe that, think, think I believe that with all my heart at this moment. But it's not just my beliefs that create the location that I'm passing into. It's also my emotions. And if my emotions are ones of anger and resentment towards other people who are not of the same faith as me, then I have learned very little about love. Thank you. And therefore... I am only going to be in a position where that amount of love exists. Thank you for a million years since I've been a kid. <laughs> since I've been, well, you know what I mean. Since I've been a kid. Everybody, 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 I've never been a person, I've always been what I call a guardian, okay, because I didn't like Christianity. I don't believe in the Bible. I never believed in whatever the Muslim things are or whatever. I don't have anything against what they choose to believe. Mm -hmm. But I always figured that God, Jesus, whatever, Buddha, whoever you want to call him, could never be a good... Anybody who was there would have to love everyone, no matter what. And would never make a judgment because you were a Christian or you believed in something. And people say, oh no, if you don't go through Jesus, you can't go, and I keep going, well, you know, then he's an egotistical jerk, and who would want to know him? It was just, and people are, like, really offended by that. They believe this. So and I'm going, no, no, no. Jesus can't be this way. God can't be this way. God's got to be God for everybody who walks on the planet, not just one kind of people. Okay? And I want to thank you, because it is one of the questions I've had for so long, it's the reason that I said yesterday that it, I never did the Jesus thing was because when you when you get what the Bible does, and I don't believe in it at all, I think it was written by humans and like all the other books it was tainted. It was, um, God wouldn't think that way. God would love everyone. God would never say you have to be this for me to love you. Because God would love everybody. And Jesus never would have been, because Jesus... It, it actually, Jesus was a Jew. So if if he was one thing, then that would be the only people that, that you would love or he would love or whatever. You answered two really important questions that I really wanted to, I, I had in my mind, in my heart, in my whole life, I always knew it had to be a Unitarian choice and where you were born and your family background and your culture and your country had a lot to do with how you believed. Not a book, not a space, but God would love everyone the same. Is that true? Um, 
God has a general love for everyone exactly the same. And God has a desire for you to have a personal relationship with God. Yeah. But the amount of love inside of your soul that exists is totally dependent upon your longing for it. Right. Does that make sense? So yeah, but it... I always... Okay, this is going to sound really weird because I don't know, maybe I am talking to Jesus. But okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to call you an egotistical jerk because I didn't think you believed that. I thought somebody who wrote the Bible believed that. But the, but the thing was that... Um, the thing was that if people all over the planet had as much love for God as they have for books and people who come across and say, oh, you got to believe this and you got to believe that and you got to believe this in whatever country or religion they picked. Yeah. If they had as much just faith in God and said, you know, I'm going to talk to, to him, yeah. you wouldn't have half the problems that religion creates on this planet, you know, <laughs> or the people that create it. I mean, I, I sort of have something against religion in itself, the, in the purest sense, the way that people misuse it. But I never believed that God could be like that. I always believed God had to be pure love, and God had to love everyone. <laughs> is, that is true? That's fun. Thank you! Okay, I'm a happy camper now. My little dark spirits that were going, oh, please, I hope I hear that, you know, have, are happy now. Uh, I hope when we go through life, we're progressing in our development. So is it any road signs or yeah. indicators that I'm progressing, or I'm standing, or I'm going to go back, you know, like some road signs of success or something, <laughs> or failure, <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, there's a really, really big road sign. Oh, good. I yeah. probably missed it. <laughs> and it's called the Law of Attraction. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> the, the Law of Attraction will demonstrate to you at any one time what's actually going on with your life. Mm -hmm. And as, as you release more and more emotions that are harming yourself, what happens is the Law of Attraction changes and you find that you are attracting more and more interesting events rather than difficult events. And you'll be attracting more and more joyous events rather than sad events or angry events or any of those kind of things. So the law of attraction is just a wonderful way of being able to tell, see how you're, how you're progressing. Of course, that's a little bit daunting at the beginning because the law of attraction is bringing you moment after moment of all sorts of different things triggering all sorts of emotions. But as you progress, you'll find the law of attraction will change around you. But even bigger than the law of attraction is the feelings that you get from God and, and the intensity of those feelings. You'll find that as you release different emotions and you direct your longing to God to receive their love, the intensity of those feelings that actually enter you during those moments of prayer uh, are going to just grow and grow and grow. And you'll get to a point where um, it becomes, in fact, the most strongest feelings that you've ever experienced. Right? And, you, and they will continue to grow as you change as well. So that is also another way of seeing how, you, how you're doing. Now obviously, if that intensity of those events are not changing in your life, then obviously you're stagnant. And if you're stagnant, then look at the law of attraction. What is it bringing you? Because that, that will already be identifying the emotions that we need to work on to get beyond that point. Most people are not honest with themselves about reception of divine love. They have an intellectual concept about what receiving divine love really means. And they don't understand, that they don't yet really feel the emotions of what's going on within themselves and, and how that's changing. So, so a lot of times they're in a, st a stagnant condition. There's many people I know who have been uh, on what they think is the divine love path for 30 or 40 years, and yet are still in quite a very sad and angry condition. Uh, and the reason why that is the case is because they are refusing to acknowledge that they're actually not receiving divine love. And they're refusing to acknowledge that there's a reason why they're not receiving divine love. 
I've even heard some of them say that they must there must be something wrong with the pageant messages or something must be something wrong with the way it's all being described because that's not how it is to them and all that kind of stuff. And all they're doing is not being honest with themselves. They're not being honest that there's an emotion within themselves that's just preventing that love from flowing into their heart that they're holding on to for good and death, right? And they need to release that emotion and work through that emotion before they'll receive a stronger flow of love from God. But you get to the point when you're at one with God that you'll feel that flow of emotion from God constantly. And it's like a tingling vibration throughout your entire body at that point. And so you know you're constantly in contact with God. And, and because of that feeling, you'll be constantly in a state of bliss as well. It's not bliss that's intellectually manufactured, where I think or I believe I'm in a state of bliss. It's actually you feel throughout your entire fiber that this state of bliss is where you're at. So if you're not yet at that state, then you're not yet at one with God, that's fine. Let yourself work through the emotions as to what's preventing that connection. Let yourself continue to let these emotions flow. Try to stop this thing from kicking in and telling yourself you're there when you're actually back here. You know? This is one of the biggest problems people have on earth today is that they want to believe they're on a spiritual path and they want to believe they're really progressed. And so they feel that they're really way up here when really they're right back here emotionally. And that's one of the biggest issues that I face when I'm traveling with people is that like, quite often I'm invited to stay with people and I know before I even go that they're not even going to cope with 10 minutes with me. <laughs> and in 10 minutes I know they're just going to be angry with me. Um, and, and, and so sure enough I go there and within 10 minutes or 15 minutes they're angry with me and I've got to leave. Um, and the reason why that is is because most people have the false conceptions of where they really are in terms of their growth, particularly if they spent 20 or 30 years on spiritual paths, investigating spirituality and progressing. I remember, Gabby, when I first met your mum, one of the things she said to me about a month afterwards was, you're, you're, she told me, she said, you're telling me really that I don't know anything at all. <laughs> and I said, well, no, that's not really what I'm telling you, but if that's what it feels like, <laughs> then you need to go with that feeling. But, um, then she rang me about, she got really upset with that, really angry, and, uh, and then for about seven, six or seven months wouldn't speak to me at all. And I just kept, I just sent the occasional email, I love you, Natalie. <laughs> um, and eventually she wouldn't accept those either, so I finished up writing to a friend of hers in Barbados, can you remind Natalie that I love her? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and she received one of those emails, and then, and then she decided to reread the emails from, from seven months earlier. And when she reread them, she realised that she'd grown enough in those seven months to recognise that everything that was said to her right back in those original emails was actually true. And she actually contacted me and then, and, and then admitted to me that one of the hardest emotions that she's ever had to deal with was the fact that she really didn't know anything. After 30 years of being a medium, 30 years of speaking to spirits, 30 years of being on a spiritualist path, that really she didn't know anything about her soul. Is it something about pride? Yeah, it's it's that, and it's also it's also you know how you have the feeling that you've in, you've invested thirty years of your oh, life mm -hmm. in something, and you just don't want to give it up. You know what I mean? It's like it's like that. Some some of you may feel like that in your marriage. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you, you know you're not really sure whether you want to be in a marriage, but you spent thirty years in it, right? And some, that counts for something as well we want to believe inside of ourselves most often, right? And the truth is, when it comes to our spiritual journey, what counts is how humble we can be at any one moment and how accepting we can be of new truth at any one moment. And everything that we've ever experienced in the past really doesn't count for much when it comes to, to accepting truth from God. And once we get into a state where we're, we're truly reliant on God, now we're in a state where we can really progress rapidly. And often it's our mental conceptions of not wanting to give up 
what we've done in the past that actually inhibit us in growing in the future. Thinking that we're somewhere where we are not. This is often confronted when we pass into the spirit world. See, a lot of people who are on spiritualist paths, I was talking with this uh, uh, lady through, we were, myself and Natalie were doing a bit of a medium session with some spirits, and one lady who was a, I think her name is uh, Catherine Stokes, or, I can't quite remember her name. She was a medium in the Dorothy. UK, Dorothy, Dorothy, Stokes. Stokes. Dorothy Stokes. She was a medium in the UK in the 60s and 70s. And a very good medium too. She was. She went around doing large groups of, uh, and far more accurate than say someone like John Edwards or someone like that is today. And she didn't charge for her, a lot of her sessions. She did it for free. She was. Uh, she was quite open like that. But when she came to talk with us, she said that uh, one thing, she found the spirit world very, very difficult, and that surprised her because she thought after talking to spirits for, for 30 or 40 years, or so said actually longer than that, she actually thought that when she arrived in the spirit world it would all be a breeze, like that she actually thought she knew everything there was to know about it. And it was only a few months earlier that she attended one of our sessions as a spirit and learnt about the divine path that she really started to feel any hope. Because for the previous, I think it was 10 or 8 years or something, or something since she passed, I can't remember the amount of time now, but for that previous amount of time she was actually in quite a bit of darkness and suffering for herself because of all of these conceptions she had about the spirit world that weren't what was reality for her when she passed. And she didn't know anything about soul condition, she didn't understand what soul condition was all about. What is that? Soul condition is the condition that you have within you emotionally. So it's got nothing to do with beliefs, it's got nothing to do with intellectual concepts, it's everything to do with your real condition. Perhaps if I can illustrate that. Let's say I have anger with men inside of me. Well, when I pass, I will not pass into the second sphere if I have that inside of me. And it doesn't matter whether you've been abused by a man or rebelled around by a man or any other thing that would have happened to you here on earth. While you retain that anger with men inside of your soul, you will not ever get into the second sphere. So it's all about forgiveness? It's not all about forgiveness, no. There's a lot of other things it's about besides forgiveness. But forgiveness is one of the things. And it, but, it, but see, forgiveness again is something that needs to be from the heart. You need to release the emotions that actually cause you to not forgive. Once you release those emotions, you will automatically forgive. So anger always covers something else. So anger in this case would be covering the sadness of all the things that she experienced in her life. Now, if I'm not willing to experience those emotions, I will not progress. So I can believe all I want that I'm in a six-sphere condition or a fifth-sphere condition or I'm going to pass into a really nice location and I can believe that all I want but what will determine the location into which I pass will be the condition of my soul, which is the real me, my emotions, my passions, my desires, my intentions, the real me, and that is where I'm going to be attracted, whatever that condition is, and that will be my attraction to a location that matches that condition. And this lady, Karen, this lady Dorothy Stokes, who is the medium, um, she was not aware of that, even as a medium, and being a medium for 30 years, she wasn't aware of that. And because of her lack of awareness of that, when she passed, she, she had so many issues to work through, because firstly, she demanded, she want, why wasn't she where she, she thought she would be? Mm -hmm. right? Who's then, in charge? Yeah, who's in charge? <laughs> it's like in the, in the Robert James Lee's book, at, uh, I think it's in The Life of Elysium, he, he mentions this priest, this minister passes over, and he's in rags, right? He's dressed in these rags. And, and he says, the minister says, uh, 
I want to speak to someone in charge. Who's <laughs> 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 the creator of this universe? Yeah, who's <laughs> the creator of this universe? Right I want to talk to who's in charge and they've got to get me out of this rag. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there a Saint Peter? Sorry? No, it's just a joke. Is there a Saint Peter? Well, there is a person who was Peter who lived with me on the earth. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. Does he hang around the pearly gates a lot? No. The pearly gates are are a, a um, well an analogy for the gate of heaven, which is the transition between the seventh sphere and the first celestial. So there sphere. is something like that. Yeah, certainly, there are locations in the spirit world that are like gates into uh, into a new condition, mm. and uh, you must go through a process, emotional process, to get you from one part of that from one side of that gate to the other side of the gate. So before you were talking about the third sphere where you learn to make plants grow and stuff, so if you pass into like the fifth sphere, what happens? Have you been learning that stuff in your sleep state? Mm -hmm. or do you have to go back? Yeah. Yeah, so if you, if you develop yourself now on an earth to the fifth sphere condition before you pass, then in your sleep state, every you have a house already in the fifth sphere and and you'll remember it actually once you once you go there you'll actually remember all of your sleep state really? things all the things oh, the dreams uh, they're not dreams they're actually reality they're actually experiences that you have in your sleep state in, in out of body and you will remember every one of them but dreams are something different well it, like i said last night there is sort of like there's two types of dreams one type of dream is the actual reality of the experience in the sleep state. The other type of dream, which is mostly connected with emotions, is to tell you about the emotions you are not dealing with in the awake state that you need to be dealing with. And, and where do those, those sort of dreams come from? The soul or the mind? All of the dreams about that are emotional come from a, usually a collection of places. They come from firstly through your soul, but often they come from your guides, where your guides are just trying to trigger and prompt certain emotions, and they've talked to you about it in the sleep state, and then placed little images and, and chains of, of events inside of inside of you, so that you're conscious of them when you're awake, and and in order to help bring up some of those emotions. So let's say. Tonight you go to sleep and then halfway through the night you wake up in the dead of fear mm -hmm. and, and you know, you're shaking and you just have this dream about someone chasing you with a knife or something. Mm -hmm. Well that kind of a dream is actually there to explain to you what feelings you are not dealing with in your awake state. I feel foolish but that's something else I have to work on. Yeah. So that's good. I'm working. <laughs> All right. So, so often through the night, I sometimes I wake up and the bed is just soaking. Other times it's slightly damp, whatever. I'm, I'm, all right. What is happening in that state? Am I releasing? A lot of anxiety and fear. Boy, I wish I brought my guitar. I've got one in the car. Do you want it? Just reminds me of that song. Not a way to go with my sheet soaking wet. Oh, now he's doing it. Oh my God, I stepped out there and risked and you know, he steps on my toes. Yeah. But actually, what's actually happening is, yes, you do process emotions in your sleep state. Um, and in your sleep state, you are just as capable of processing emotions as you are in your awake state, if the sleep state emotions were created in your sleep state. So, so let's, say, let's say in your sleep state, when you first uh, experienced your sleep state, you were in the first fear condition, then obviously a lot of the things you would have seen in your sleep state would have been quite scary. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And there would have been lots of fear associated with those sleep state events that you only remember in your sleep state. And yes, you will actually process them in your sleep state as well. You will release them emotionally once you set your intention to deal with your emotions. You will release them emotionally in the sleep state. The Often the sleep state and awake state, uh, emotions are very similar though. Often we have some deep fears in the awake state as well that we are refusing to acknowledge. 
And so usually when we're doing things like waking up in a sweat or you know waking up with the machine's wet from a, from you know perspiration or whatever, that's a good indication that we're actually ignoring some awake state emotions as well. And and we need to allow ourselves to start addressing the terror that we feel within us. So terror is a very, very difficult emotion to deal with. Because when you feel it, you will be terrified. When you experience it, you will feel terrified. And so it's a very difficult emotion for most people to, to allow themselves to go into. But it is an emotion, just like all other emotions, that it does need to be released by experience. And all that's happening in those kind of things is you, you're, you're just triggering some of these emotions. In the sleep state, you're releasing emotion that were created in the sleep state. And in the wake state, you're releasing emotion that was created in the wake state. I have a couple more questions, if we could just stay with this. I mean, like at night, our house is 72, so it's not hot, and I'm older, so, you know. Um, <clears throat> so, and our house during the days, and we keep it cool, okay? I, again, all of a sudden, out of, I'll be fine, and then I'm hot again. So we sit. Even though I'm working on something or doing something, I'm processing something. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Even in the Can I just uh, say open. what emotions you're actually processing? Of course. Yep. And when you feel hot and cold, and this applies particularly, um, so I'm going to say some things to, to women, the women in the audience, right? Yeah. <laughs> hot and <I'm> sorry. <laughs> menopause. <laughs> yes. Almost. There is no such thing as menopause. For real. Oh, good. <laughs> okay, cool. I like that. But I'm not suggesting going off your patches. <laughs> the reason why is because there's emotions that are triggering that response in your body at a certain age. And the emotions relate to femininity, sexual shame, and guilt. And what you'll find once you work your way through a lot of these emotions, and also emotions of feeling like you are dependent upon physical solutions for spiritual problems. And all of these emotions create a situation, a circumstance within your body that your body desires dependence on substances, whatever those substances are. And if I can just give you an experience of Natalie's during this process. Natalie had a hysterectomy uh, through her life, and so she was on patches, on, on hormone patches for most of her life. And, and we, we started talking about, uh, during the travel, she spent nearly six months with me traveling, and during the travels I started talking to her about the dependency upon these patches. And she'd get quite upset with me about <laughs> it, uh, saying that I'm, I'm a man and I wouldn't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and what I kept on reminding her is that every single thing that's happening within our body is emotional. Every single thing. So the pain you have in childbirth as a woman is emotional. The pain that you have with regard to once a month periods is related to emotions. And the pain that you have and the physical responses you have during menopause are also related to emotions. And they're related very much to the emotions and the generational emotions that most women have because women generally through history have been treated very badly. And women generally through history have been treated badly in a number of different areas. Not just in sort of physically being treated badly or being put down emotionally, but also being treated badly sexually. And this multi-generational abuse that's gone on towards women has carried an emotional burden right down to our day to day. And actually is in within each of you, each of you ladies, it's within, as well as each of the men from a male point of view as well there is also this same constant generational thing within the men as well. When you come to deal with those emotions, you will find that you'll get to a point where you feel like you do not need this kind of medication anymore. And you will actually go off it and you will feel stable. You won't go up and down emotionally. A lot of times, people get to menopause and they start feeling these up and down emotional swings, right? 
very similar in many cases, if you think about it, to the emotional swings that you may have experienced when you were pregnant. Mm -hmm. right? And the reason why these emotional swings occur during those times is because they are reminding you of your own femininity. That there are issues within that you are not wanting to deal with emotionally on those subjects. And the key is to go into those subjects and deal with them emotionally. Now, when Natalie went through a lot of these experiences, uh, she actually, and released these emotions, what happened was that her body started changing and she started not needing what she thought she need, needed before. And now she's actually gone off of her hormone treatment altogether. Now normally, her son, Ben, uh, Gabby's brother, commented that normally after a few days she'd be a raging, what did he call her, a raging, a raging bitch I think he called her, <laughs> so, something pretty good. He said normally after two days after she's gone off this medication she would normally just be in this uncontrollable rage and he's just totally blown away that three weeks or four weeks after uh, when he was with her she was still like a loving, the lo a loving mother that he'd never really <laughs> met before. <laughs> right? and, and so this is what is ahead of you, and this applies to all medication, um, whatever, whatever it is. You'll find that there'll be a time in the future where you know you won't need it. And, and it will be because you've actually dealt with the emotions that create the need for it. Is there something parallel for the men you yeah. <laughs> well, you think about a lot of men issues uh, that men generally have. What what are they related to generally? Women. <laughs> <laughs> well, what emotions, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> Afraid about what she thinks. <laughs> no, no, go within. Like, you look at the, the stuff that's within men generally, it's like, you look at most men, most men have some weight around the middle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Do they not? By the time they age, right? Most men have some weight around the middle. By the time they get to, you know, in their 40s, most men are also experiencing sometimes some sexual issues, right? By the time they get into late, maybe 50s or 60s, often prostrate starts to occur. These are all related to sexual issues that are unresolved. Right? They are also all related to the treatment of women, actually, and how men generationally have treated women, not how you yourself specifically have treated them, but how there's this constant emotional damage that's been reflected down through the generations. So there are just as many problems for men as there are for women related to the masculinity and femininity issues. The issues that women face are more to do with how badly they've been treated. The issues that men face are more to do with how badly they've treated women. And so they are sort of like two ends of the, of the same spectrum of different emotions that we've been worked through. Miss uh, Dutton just started to say about like hot and cold, people like yeah. John saying, and he said like, generally when like you feel hot or cold and this, what does it mean? This is started to say and kind of you. Remember I mentioned that they are usually to do with shame issues mm -hmm. so, and, and a lot related to sexual shame issues. Mm -hmm. And hot and cold also very much anger and fear mm -hmm. as well. So, so they are a combination. When a person is in a state of fear, all the extremities will start to go cold. So if you find you've got cold hands and cold feet, for example, and that's a fairly constant thing with you, then there's fears within you that you are not facing. Right? If you find that uh, you um, often feel sort of a feeling of anger rise within you that you keep keep down, but you also feel like hot at night, or you feel like you need a fan on all the time, or you feel like you need the aircon down <laughs> quite a lot, then it will usually be related to issues of shame or anger that uh, you're actually experiencing in those things. The truth is that the human body is capable of, a la of coping with a large variety of temperatures without having clothing. And, and, and if we are very, very, if we are in a very, very, you know, slim area, like anything of 
below 22 and anything above 26 <laughs> is no good, then, then what's actually going on is that there is emotions being triggered at those temperatures and you need to allow yourself to go into those emotions rather than using the air conditioning thermostat. <laughs> right? so, so allow yourself to trigger these emotions. Anything that makes you uncomfortable generally has some fairly large emotions underneath them. And if you allow yourself to just go into your discomfort rather than avoiding your discomfort, you will find you'll be able to access whole groups of emotions that you are masking by being comfortable. The same applies, by the way, to food. Um, like many people find that, you know, one hour after the time to eat and they are feeling like pretty antsy, right? Pretty upset. And if that's the case, my suggestion would be leave it two hours before you eat and really let yourself get into the emotion that's in there. Because there's an emotion there that's causing you to get into that state. The body can cope with... The body actually can live on very, very minor amounts of food. And in fact, once you're in a condition of one with God, you actually will not need food if you don't want it. And so the body can live really, really easily uh, through other sources of energy rather than food. If you feel like you must have food, then usually there's emotions driving, driving that desire. Let yourself feel them and let yourself work through them. Yeah. Are we on the same subject? No. We've got more on this one for a while. <laughs> um, I have a couple of questions for you. Now, if you're talking about hot and cold the way you feel. Right, like uh, I'll get specific. For myself, when I get ready to go to sleep or something, I think that I'm sort of chilly. But my former partner would say that I felt so hot that I would burn them. And this was a very consistent thing every every time I go to sleep. And it didn't matter whether I lay down or I just actually fall asleep on the couch. They said just to touch my skin was burning. Am I dealing with something in that, or is it because I felt comfortable to myself? And yeah, you're going to have to trust yourself. But there are some obviously some things about about that. If your body temperature is hotter than average, then there are always emotional reasons why. Right? Now, when your body temperature is hotter than average, you will actually probably feel colder in certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, than the average person. Uh, and the same goes with the opposite. If your body temperature is colder than average, you might feel hotter than certain people. Um, but all of these things are based upon emotions within the soul, all of them. The key is to not intellectualise them, but rather just allow yourself to get into a state of discomfort. Mm -hmm. See, what, what we do nowadays is we get, we, we're often uncomfortable. But what we do is we adjust our environment to make ourselves feel comfortable. So let's say, uh, like, I, oh yeah, I'm allergic to cats. So what do I do? Remove the cat. cats. Yeah. cats. Yeah. I'm, uh, you know, I don't. I'm allergic to dog hair. So what do I do? Yeah, I'm, you know, don't like anything under 22 degrees. So what do I do? I move to Florida. <laughs> you know, that's what we do. Right? Yeah. We, we create our environment to make ourselves more comfortable. The question becomes, why, why not firstly deal with the emotion that's creating that discomfort? Because if you do that, you won't be masking it with an action. There, are, there will be many times in your future progression where you'll be tempted to mask an emotion with an action to make you feel more comfortable. For example, the other day, I was in Barbados and I went swimming in the sea, and I was going swimming every day in the sea, but there were some emotions coming up, and I talked to some really evil spirits the day before as well, and there was a combination of events that occurred where I got stung by a jellyfish. It uh, stung me right from here right the way down through my thighs as I swam over. And uh, I don't know if any of you have been stung by one, but uh, yeah, for about the next six or seven hours, it was pretty painful. Now, I know there's a physical way for me to get out of that sting, right? Uh, and quite easy. But what I decided to do was to stay in it. Right? So I felt like the whole side of my body was burning. 
um, and I was crying and, and just stopping and letting myself feel all of my emotions from it. Rather than choosing just to... Or we on it or something. You know, yeah. and, and, just, and it all just go away. So, so I attracted that event. That event was attracted by an emotion within me that I needed to deal with. So I allowed myself to go through that emotion, even though it was really painful for me at the time, in order to actually fully release that emotion. So because I'm doing this at night like that, would I be dealing with emotions in the other realm or in this realm? You could be dealing with in the other realm, but don't don't then go down the road and think, well, if I can process in my sleep state, that's really good. No, so that's what not what I'm doing. I'm just <laughs> yeah, don't go down that track because all you'll do there is justify a heap of awake state emotions that you want to deal with. So, what would be a way to at least discover what emotions I'm dealing with. Why do you need to? Okay, just let them go and let them. They'll just come up. Just let them go yeah. and let them. See, one of the biggest problems we face with emotional processing is we want to know why. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it, 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 like, do you think little Luca wants to know why he's screaming? Like, <laughs> no. He just screams, doesn't he, until it's done. Like, do you think he wants to know why he's crying? No, he doesn't. He just cries until it's done. Become like a child with your emotions. Right? Let yourself just feel what they are. You don't have to know what they are. Because knowing what they are doesn't release them. Feeling what they are is the only thing that releases them. So we just, just let them go, let them feel, and we don't really care. No. And usually them. afterwards you'll become clear about what they are anyway. But even if you don't, well that's okay because there are whole groups of emotions that you will not know what they are even afterwards because you weren't, you didn't have a conscious memory at their time of creation. So in other words, from the moment of conception right the way through to sort of the time that you can remember, there's whole groups of emotions you were soaking up from your parents, for example, and your environment that you really do not have any intellectual awareness of aside from the law of attraction telling you what they are. Let yourself just feel them. Don't worry about trying to explain them or where they came from or what event triggered them and all those kind of things. In the end, all of that information probably will come to you. But in the end, the information really is pointless anyway because it doesn't make it any better. All you need to do is feel the emotion. And that's what's going to make it better. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I have one more question in this sort of realm. Um, you were talking about how the physical body is a manifestation of some of the emotions from our past, like different physical things that take place as we get into different age groups and things. As we release that stuff, does our body revert back? So an indicator for, I, I, you know, I also like indicators. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> kind of an engineer. But an indicator would be to look at what our body is doing and it's telling us. Mm -hmm. Very much so. And as it starts making, as we make the changes, the body will reflect those changes on the outside. That's right. And on the inside. Like, so your body, like, let's say you have digestive problems all of your life. Mm -hmm. Well, that's emotional based. And if you mm -hmm. deal with those emotions related to the second and third chakras, all of those digestive issues will disappear. You'll know they've disappeared and you'll feel good all of a sudden. You won't have to take alka seltzers and, mm -hmm. and everything else to, to make yourself feel better. You just feel better. And it's the same with pretty much all emotions. You might have joint pain. Mm -hmm. Joint pains are related to different types of emotions too. So if you've got joint pain, a lot of people take glue socamine or whatever it is. Glucosamine. Omega-3s. Or omega-3s and omega-6s omega 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 and all those kind of things, which is fine. You know, you can do whatever you like there. That's your call. But at the end of the day, they're all emotionally based. And you will find once you deal with the emotions, they will disappear. I had some really bad problems with my hips clunking. Like they would clunk like a... You know, like tractor. You know, every time I went like that, I go clunk, clunk, clunk. And you could hear it, like you could hear it, like five or ten feet away. And uh, and that, all that's disappeared just through working my way through some of the emotions that, that control the muscles all the way through, all the way through the lower half of my body. So uh, everything that you experience is going to be have an emotion, and when you release the emotion, you will change. Your body will change. Now, obviously, as you're if you're older, the recovery process is a little slower. 
and it's slower because of all the, all of the damage we've done to our body emotionally <laughs> up until that point, right? So, you know, a, a child, if they went through an emotion that causes a certain illness, you know, within a few days, they can often be just totally different. Mm. As an adult, it may take a month or two or a bit longer to recover from some of the things that actually change within us emotionally. But yeah, the body is a very, very good barometer. So let me ask you quickly, the longest time about, uh, about comfort, just a very good illustration from last night. It, it may be totally off base or it may be on target. But when I was, last night, I was sitting in one of these awful white chairs. Okay? <laughs> awful white chairs. And I was, I was absolutely in pain. I mean, I, I don't know if anybody knows me, but I was whisking around all the time and trying, because I was actually uh, bending it over and I felt like I was going to fall over. So finally I got it up. I got up and I finally sat back there and went good chair. Now, is that something silly or is that actually somehow related to also seeking comfort? All pain is related to something emotionally. Like uh, last night in the first half of the session, I had back pain. In the second half of the session, I didn't. Mm -hmm. And that was related to emotions that I was conscious of while I was speaking in the first half of the session. Mm -hmm. So, so every single thing you experience is emotional. Of course, you can always get into a more comfortable position and then say that emotion doesn't exist, which we, is what we often do. So what we often finish up doing is, say, well, yeah, no, my bum serves or so I'll go and find a comfortable chair and my bum won't be sore anymore. And now, obviously, there are some things that are going to hurt the physical body. And, but then you've got to ask yourself, well, why did you choose that? chair in the first place anyway. Like, do you know what I mean? Because like, you would have, wouldn't you have initially, like before I sat down on these, I've got a chest, yeah. one of these, you know what I mean? <laughs> and why wouldn't you have done that? Yeah. There must be something going on emotionally that causes you to feel like you weren't worthy to do that. So you just mm -hmm. ask yourself those mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. Let yourself feel what's going on. But there's no harm in comfort. Obviously our father wants yeah. us to be comfortable. But the question with anything we do, is, am I doing this because I'm avoiding something? Mm -hmm. uh, and so a lot of people, uh, just can I say a bit more about this? A lot of people drink alcoholic beverages because they're avoiding something. In fact, almost all people who drink alcoholic beverages, beverages are avoiding something. You think about when you want to drink an alcoholic beverage, when you want to drink some wine, when is it? When you really feel like you need one, when it is. <laughs> well, the French drink wine all the time. They it's, do. It's the part of their culture. culture. But here, let but here you, you feel about relax. it when you're doing it. That's the question I'm asking. When relaxing. I feel like I want to relax. I feel like I need some help to relax. Yeah. Right? Many times that's the motivator, right? Mm -hmm. So then ask yourself, why do I feel like I need to relax? What have I done today where I've treated myself so badly that now I need a tool to help me relax? There's something going on. Obviously, I'm I'm trying to run away from something emotionally, or I'm treating myself badly enough where I need a, something that is a depressant to actually keep to make me relax. Let's look at coffee. How many could be coffee drinkers? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Coffee. You know, obviously, coffee damages an unborn child. Like you know that, right? So therefore, if coffee damages an unborn child, then obviously there are issues with caffeine in terms of how it affects the body. You can drink as much coffee as you want. I can guarantee you, though, you will not ever be a one with your father drinking coffee. <laughs> yeah. Or any caffeine, right? Not just coffee. Because you're choosing to harm your body, right? Um, and there's an issue morally. When you're choosing to harm your body, there obviously is an issue within yourself as to why you feel that you need to do that. And most people go for coffee for reasons of stimulant. Like they need to be stimulated. They need to get the pick-me-up to get themselves into a certain emotional condition. Ask yourself before you have the drink, why do I feel like I need this picking up? What's going on within me emotionally? You see, we're constantly using all these little tools, right? All these little, food is another one, big one. Uh, TV, videos, no, there's nothing wrong with it. Like, you can have your coffee if you want coffee. There's nothing wrong with any of these things. I'm just saying to you that if you're avoiding an emotion, now your motive is really out of harmony with love. What you're saying is the reason for using it. If you're using it to help you relax, then, or if you're trying to get comfortable, 
to avoid the emotion, but you want to protect your body too, right? So you don't want to put it in a situation right. of harm. Yeah. There's going to be a dependency on it, though. That's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not even the dependency. It's about why am I using anything at this moment? Why am I choosing to do this particular thing at this moment? Like what's going on within me emotionally? Be aware. Just let yourself become aware of what's really happening. Because right. in the end, you will be completely aware of every single emotion passing through you at any one moment. That's where you're headed. To be completely aware of every single emotion that is passing through you at any single moment. Is that what happens when you die? As you're dying? Well, you don't have to die to get into that state. <laughs> no, no, I just wondered if, because people say your life flashes before your eyes, kind of, is the old superstition thing. Yeah, no, the, what's happening when you're dying is a little different. But if I can get to that perhaps later and we go back to this subject. Okay, I didn't mean I just... Yeah. The, 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 issue, the issue for, mo for most of us is that we are constantly using tools to deny our emotions. And if we can stop doing that, if we can notice what we're doing, and stop doing that, what will happen is the emotion will be exposed. When we run to the addiction, we are actually every single time avoiding the exposure of the underlying emotion. So let's say you know, I get up in the morning, the first thing I normally do is have a coffee, right? and maybe a cigarette too, just to, to help it. Um, so then the question I need to ask myself, all right, why am I doing that to myself emotionally? Like, what, what emotions am I in this state when I first wake up? How am I really feeling right now? And you'll find that it's just a world will open up to you if you can ask yourself that one question. Because you'll find that there are certain emotions of fear and anger and sadness and everything from your sleep state experience that you're not allowing yourself to feel as soon as you wake up that you're wanting to get away from in order to pick yourself up and face the day. You will also feel even things like, wow, I don't even want to face today. Mm -hmm. Like, do I, I don't even want to go to work today, but I have to. Mm -hmm. Oh, do I really have to? You'll work through all issues of de desires and longings and all those kind of things you'll work through as well, right? If you just face some of these little tiny minor issues, which in reality often are huge issues capped by an addiction, right? There's a little cap on the top, like a screw cap on the bottle, which is the addiction, like a coffee in the morning. That's a good way to get rid of all of that. <laughs>
once you get to that state, you'll be able to speak to the boss just from that perspective of love after you've dealt with those emotions. And you'll be able to show him what he's doing. Okay. What's but my, not before then. Once my issues are gone. Once your issues are gone. If you try to do it when your issues are not gone, what you'll finish up doing is actually probably getting into a state of anger with him and creating more damage to yourself. Uh, the key with all of these emotions is to first deal with your own stuff. So like, um, to give you an example, last Monday night, there was a group of us, uh, uh, there's Mike, Fee, Little Luca, Gabby, myself, and Natalie, Gabby's mother, and, um, and Angela. And we all arrived at this motel, right, that had been booked for us by somebody else. We arrived at this motel, after a pretty long day of travelling, we travelled, we had to get up, uh, you know, we were up pretty early that morning, we were swimming over in Barbados, then we got on this plane in, in Barbados and flew to Miami, and then by the time we got picked up the hire car, there was this great big long line in this hire car thing, and everyone was sitting around for about an hour and a half waiting to, you know, be served and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, by this stage, quite a few of the group were starting to get, you know, hungry, tired, right? So now's the time when the motions can start. Yeah. <laughs> so we go out and have something to eat and, uh, and the meal was quite nice and everything and then we went to this motel. So we finished up rocking up at this motel about, I think it was 9.30, quarter to 10, something like that. Pretty, pretty late anyway. And uh, this motel was in a really sleazy location. Uh, lots of spirits around. Uh, there were hookers out the front. Um, <coughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And we walk into this motel, and I put all the stuff down, the, the paperwork, and and the guy behind the counter says, oh, well, you know, you booked this through somebody else. It wasn't me that did the booking, of course. And your name's not on this, and so um, I've got to get all the paperwork changed before we can let you get a room. Yeah, more weird. Right. Anyway, we started going through this process of getting all the paperwork changed or whatever. Anyway, to cut a long story short, two hours later, <laughs> we, was, Love attraction. we weren't Love yet beautiful. checking into the room. <laughs> and by this stage, everyone's getting upset with AJ as well, right? <laughs> so I'm there feeling all these different projection emotions. Like Gabby was pretty upset when you were starting to get pretty upset. And Nat Natalie was really, really angry. She was in a rage with me, and, and 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 Mike was sort of like, I want to get to another place. I want to go to another place. And she's, and, and V's out in the car, nursing her, and you know, it's all just, everyone's just starting to get wear it all a bit thin, right? And that's not that's only the beginning of the story. <laughs> now, I, with all the stuff that was being projected at me at the time. What I did was I just went through the paces and finished up getting our rooms and everyone went to the rooms and I could still feel everyone's projection of emotion at me. But I just went to my room and allowed myself to feel my emotions. And the emotions that come up for me was emotions of like people not understanding how much I love for them and care for them and people not understanding that I knew exactly what was going on. There was a combination of some very wicked spirits and a lot of other things going on to create these events just to trigger everyone's emotions around me. And and I knew that all of those things were happening, but, but, but nobody else knew. And they weren't in a space by that stage where I could actually tell them either. Now, I just felt those emotions. That's all I did. I didn't address it with anybody, even though I could have addressed it there and then. And I could have said, why are you getting upset and angry at me? You shouldn't be <laughs> you know, and I could have done that. But all I did was just address the emotions within myself. So I had a really good night's sleep. <laughs> No one else does. <laughs> oh, no, Ange, Ange did it. And Mick and Mike and Fee got this room where alarms kept going off in the night. The car, the car that we hired was smashed and broken into. The uh, um, not broken into, just smashed the with the the back light was all smashed. My bathroom. The alarms went off. My the bathroom, bathroom above just leaked into their bathroom and left their bathroom. Oh. <laughs> So then they had to <laughs> and there were plastic seat sheets on the bed, so that sort of made them think that maybe every room had plastic sheets on the bed. And maybe this was just really a brothel running as a hotel. Never heard of that. And and, uh, and then 
you know, that was triggering heaps of things in Natalie and Gabby too, of course, because there were all these spirits who were really, really angry around as well. And because Natalie and Gabby are the most mediumistic of the group, they were feeling all this rage and anger and getting yeah, all that impressed on them, you know. And so, like I happen last sleep and wake up in the morning <laughs> after I've done my magic. And then we come out to the to the thing and everybody's like, why didn't you kill him? Yeah. <laughs> I was hopeful. Who booked this room? <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't even know. The love and, attraction. Yeah. And, uh, and, the, and I just felt the law of attraction had operated perfectly. To just, it, like, every single person's emotions were being triggered in some manner, even my own, right? Because I was having all this unjust projection that I was having to also deal with, right? And uh, it didn't stop there because <laughs> Gabby was really, really upset and angry with me, and, and mum, her mum was even more so. And uh, and and anyway, I won't, I won't go into those details and embarrass the both of them. But in the end, it took another three or four hours before everyone connected with their emotions about everything that had happened, and just allowed themselves to work through those emotions. Now, right at the start of the day. Right when we had picked up the car and, got, and finished our meal and gone around and seen the sleazy motel, <laughs> we could have decided to go to another place. <coughs> but there's a number of things wrong with that, that would have been wrong with that decision from my perspective. Firstly, if we went to another place with the amount of spirit in the activity that was going on to create these events, it was highly likely that the place that we went to would have created the same problem. And even though it might have looked pretty, we probably would have had problem after problem while everyone wasn't dealing with their emotions. Secondly, the way I was looking at it was it was just a perfect event to bring up emotions in everybody that they weren't dealing with and that they were refusing to deal with before that time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and yet, the people at the time were saying to me that I wasn't looking after them, and, you know, I was, you know, and there was lots of projection of like, you know, they couldn't trust me anymore and, and, and so forth and so forth, right? just from this one event. And, and, and when you look back at it now, after dealing with the emotions, it's a lot different, isn't it? Like, you feel differently. But, but when you're going through the emotions, you're, all of these emotions are just flying out of you everywhere, right? And the key is just to stay in the transaction as long as possible. Getting angry, though, is the denial that we use. So once Gabby got over the anger and went into the real feelings, that's when you connected with lots of stuff, didn't you? And just released lots of stuff. It took two or three hours, but she released lots of stuff about spirits and interference from spirits and what happened when she was a child growing up with the interference of spirits that mum, you know, mum always had spirits around her. And, and, and Natalie actually took, she just emailed me about a day ago, and it took her until Thursday night from Monday to deal with all of her emotions about that one event. Because, you know, there were lots of resistances to dealing with the emotions. And I suppose what I'm illustrating in all of that is that we could have opted for comfort. And there's a chance, although with the amount of influence, it might not have been a high chance, there's a chance that we could have got a more comfortable location that suited everyone. But none of those emotions would have been accessed. And we would have had to create another event in the future yeah. to actually access those emotions. And so this is something for you to consider when you're in this state of looking for comfort or looking for something to, to make it better. Let yourself understand that every event that's happening to you is actually perfection in operation. It's actually protection in terms of exposing within you your emotional condition. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to say that about that, just to illustrate that I issue of how much you can run away from the emotion and not even be aware that you're running. Now there's another example I'd like to give, and that was I used to be allergic to cats. And I used to do the standard things that anybody did, and that is don't go near a cat. right? And have hand histamines on me so that when it, when I did accidentally touch one, <laughs> that I would actually be able to prevent the effects. Right? 
And what, what triggered it all for me was that I was staying with a couple in Dallas. This was two or three years ago now. And uh, I went out playing with the kids uh, out and into a park. And I purposefully did it to avoid the cat that was living in their house. The only reason why I played with the kids that particular moment was because I wanted to avoid the cat. <laughs> and I wasn't honest with myself about it, right? But it was pointed out to me by one of my spirit friends, actually, that, or, that I had all that they said was I needed to look at why I went to play with the kids. They didn't say anything more other than that, but I realised after a while what it was all about. <coughs> And it's interesting, once I went into the emotions, I actually sat the cat on my lap and allowed everything to happen. And, and what actually came up was all of my father's hatred towards cats. And, there was, and my feelings that I had to manufacture a hatred towards animals because my father had one to get his approval. He used to shoot every cat that went out past our backyard. Uh, doesn't matter whose pet it was, it was dead as soon as it walked in our yard. And he'd just throw them in the bin. And uh, and he still does that, by the way. So uh, there's all this rage and anger that he has about animals disturbing his environment. And um, and he expected me to have the same, and I eventually went along with that emotion. And the whole reaction to cats was all about that. As soon as I dealt with that, the cat finished up living in my room. Right? And every place that I visited afterwards on that trip, they had a cat. And they all finished up sleeping in my room. <laughs> right. And I didn't have any reactions to them after that. In fact, I don't, haven't had any reactions to cats since. I, I want to share something in that similar thing, and I'm all choked up because this is... You've been describing steps of how to deal with emotions. And before I knew of all these materials, there's another way, if you just love God and pray, because I was super allergic to cats. And about seven years ago, God sent two cats to my front porch. And I have so much love for animals that without knowing all the steps that I was allergic to cats and I was super, I mean, the neighbor would have a cat and my eyes would be watering and I'd be sneezing and all that stuff. So it was very allergic. And these two abandoned cats came to my front porch and I just felt in that moment the love for the cats was bigger. And I didn't know steps or how to deal with emotions or why I was allergic, but I just said, I love these cats more, and I would have to take them to the pound, and I don't know what's going to happen to them. And I didn't even know I was praying. I just said, I have to go with love. And those cats are there with me, and I hug them and kiss them, and they love me, and I've never been allergic to them anymore, and never had to use antihistamines or anything. So. I'm just sharing this because uh, I'm feeling really, God's love. Yeah, yeah. So what happened there was that just just by your feeling of love towards right. them, that actually helped you work through the emotional And I didn't reason. know the steps or nothing. Yeah, so yeah, you don't you need to. You can do this just like that. Yeah, yeah, you don't need to know. It's a beautiful thing. Um, when we first met, I, I used to think that I could pray for divine love and I didn't really have to be concerned with truth mm -hmm. and it would take care of itself. I know now that was wrong, and I have a capacity for more understanding of that. Could you say why you have to grow in truth and love? And if you stop in one area, you're not, you're not gonna. I'm not gonna pass over into the fifth sphere if I have some very basic errors in me. And mm. um, in the first century, I made the statement that the truth will set you free. And I notice I didn't say love will set you free. And I said truth will set you free. And the reason why I said that was because a lot of times when we begin our progression, we're not in a state of love. But we can be in a state of truth before we get into a state of love. And so the truth is like the doorway to love, if you like. It's the, it's, it's the only thing that can lead us into a condition of love if we're not in a condition of love when we begin. And so, loving the truth, searching for the truth, is going to be a really, really key part of your progression. Always going to be a key part of your progression. Even when you're in a state of one with God, the only thing after then, possibly, that will keep you growing will be your desire for more truth. Because once you're in a state of bliss, 
um, you've got no negative reasons for, you know, nothing to avoid, nothing that you're wanting to get away from in order to progress. So the only thing that's really going to keep you progressing is your desire to search for more, to be closer to God, to, to search for more truth about God. That's really the biggest thing that's going to keep you progression, progressing in your path. And then after a while, what you start realising is that to God, truth is also such an extremely important thing. If you look at every single thing that's gone wrong with the earth today, and when I say the earth, I mean mankind on the earth today, the majority of them are because mankind are in a state of not accepting truth. You look at all the facades, and all of them are the result of mankind wanting to actually present a lie as truth. And so, progression in love is not possible unless you're willing to face truth. It's just, and it's never going to be possible if you don't face truth. <coughs> and you're going to need to face truth on two levels. You're going to firstly need to face truth of what's inside of yourself. And secondly, you're going to need to finish up facing truth if you want to be at one with God. You're going to need to be facing God's truth. What is God's truth in terms of the creation of the universe and all of those bigger picture things. You'll need to see both. And if you refuse, what a lot of people do is they say, all right, I want to know the truth of God's universe. I want to know this beautiful universe that we're living in and how that's affecting me and everything. But most people do not want to know the truth about themselves. And that's the main reason why most people don't progress beyond a certain point. They learn all of the truths about the universe and unfortunately, because they're not progressing themselves emotionally, they can only learn it intellectually. And in that process, all of these emotions, that are, these emotional truths that are within, these, these errors that are within that we believe are true, that we're not facing because we don't want to see the truth of what we're doing, all of those things that are within stay and remain within. And they will continue staying and remaining in him until I have a love of all truth, not just the truth of what's external to me. Does that make sense? Is there? I have a real problem with the word truth because it's used in so many ways, especially in metaphysical circles, and everybody's searching for truth, but everybody has a different idea of what that truth is. Mm. Would you define that one more time for us, please? So when I talk about truth, I am talking about God's truth, the absolute truth. I'm not talking about your truth. They are two totally different things. Right. Often a person can be in a state where they believe something to be true, like the murderer believes that murdering somebody is okay. Obviously they would they believe that, otherwise they wouldn't do it, right? So their truth is that it's okay to murder. That is not God's truth, obviously. And so that's an extreme, but we often have uh, all of these viewpoints about what we think are true, what we believe is true, but often what we believe is true is far, far different to what is the actual truth. And what I like, the way I see it is that what we believe is true is potentially true, but it also is potentially quite false. And until God tells me differently, I won't know whether it's true or not, until I actually enter that relationship with God and have God show me through her emotions what is true and what isn't. And I won't really know what is true and what isn't because I'm coming from a position of error. So. When people in the New Age movement in particular talk about remaining in their truth, right, what they really say, it's important for you to remain truthful about how you feel. Right? But often when they say that, they're really talking about avoiding situations that are confronting to them. Right? Often that's what they're really yeah. talking about. Yeah. And they're not being honest about it. Yeah. Right? All they're doing is they're saying, all right, no, I don't want to, I need to stay in my truth here. I don't want to spend time with that person. But if they were staying in their truth, that person had been attracted into their life through the law of attraction 
to trigger an emotion within them. If they were really staying in truth, they would recognize that truth. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So a lot of times people use staying in truth as an excuse to actually run away from truth. Right? Mm -hmm. And if we continue to do that, then we are going to stagnate emotionally and also stagnate in our progression with God. The best way to know what the truth is, is are you receiving divine love right now or not? If the answer is no, I'm not, then right now there's something that you are not, or I am not, actually facing the truth about. And the law of attraction right now is actually demonstrating to me what that is. I am just ignoring it. So don't view it as God withdrawing her love, because she doesn't withdraw her love. You prevent her love from flowing into your soul because of your refusal of the truth. There's the Holy Spirit, I sometimes call the spirit of truth for that reason. The Holy Spirit can only connect. Remember I said last night that the Holy Spirit is a connector mm -hmm. between God and you. Right? So there is this connection that is connected from God that can connect him to you and the love of God flows through that connection. But the Holy Spirit can only connect to you when you are in a state of truth from God's perspective, not from your own. So as long as you are in a state of truth from God's perspective, you and, and have a longing for God's love, you will receive her love. The instant that you choose to retain what you believe is true, not seeing that God actually would not feel that that is true, the moment you choose to retain that belief and you're conscious of it and the law of attraction is trying to demonstrate that to you, there will be a severing of the connection. The plug, if you like, will be pulled out. Not by God, but by you, by your refusal to accept truth. And then it's a matter of you wanting, do you really want to discover it? How strong is your free will? How strong is your will? How strong is your intention? To discover what the truth really is. And once it's strong enough, you will find, you will see exactly what it is emotionally, feel the emotion that's preventing you from the discovery of that truth, and straight away that connection will re-establish and the flow of love will flow again. How do you know what is God's truth? Did he write it somewhere? Is somebody, I mean, is there, is there, is there something that actually says, not a book of man either, okay? Is there something that God actually says, all right, look, this is what I really believe. I mean, some way that you can actually know this, how? As you receive God's love, God's laws of truth are written on your heart. Oh, it's what you know inside. It's, but it's not, it's not what you think you know. It's actually what resonates with love inside of yourself. And what actually happens is that with this love comes knowledge and wisdom and, and a lot of other things as well as this love enters you, if you operate in harmony with truth with it. So the key, the key is you don't need to know whether something is out of harmony or in harmony. All you need to do is feel the relationship between yourself and God. If you're feeling it and you can feel the connection, then what you are currently doing is in harmony with God's love. So therefore, it's in harmony with God's truth. If you are not feeling it, if you are not feeling that connection between yourself and God at that moment, then what you are choosing to feel or think or do at that moment is not in harmony with God's love. You don't need to know anything else. You don't need to have a book. You just need to trust your emotions at any time and trust that connection. If you trust that connection 100% of the time, what will happen is you'll know the instant that you've just done something that's out of harmony. So, for instance, that's why I could say to you that drinking coffee okay. will, will actually disconnect you, right? Because I know that every time I've done it, there's been a disconnection. Oh, that I've never been connected. I drink Diet Coke 24 hours a day. <laughs> there will be moments where you have a pure desire for God's love, and you would have received it. 
but no, I do. I mean, I have the desire, but I'm just saying, if I got to give up my diet coke, I don't know. I even forgot. I mean, you can't even go there. I don't know. Well, let's see. And this is this is stuff we this is stuff we often face. All right, you know, that's honest. I don't give up yeah. my diet coke for nobody. Okay. I mean, you know. And and at some point in the future, you'll say to yourself, "Well, was the diet coke really worth this relationship with God?" I never thought of Diet Coke as interfering with it, to tell you the truth. But the receiving of truth, isn't the receiving of truth a spoon-fed thing? I mean, you kind of accept it a little bit at a time, you know? You don't no, have on a particular day, you don't get all the truth at once and just, that's you, it. You don't have to be spoon-fed it. But emotionally, <coughs> usually we do finish up being spoon-fed it right. because emotionally we have so much resistance to it. But we don't have to. If, you, know, you look at a child, a child is very, is not hardly particularly a very young child, is hardly resistant to truth at all. Right. It's only when you know we're browbeaten and through some emotional programming that they become resistant. And you will become into that state. You will come into a childlike state, exactly like that. At the moment, what's happening is we've, we've got so much mistrust, hey? There's so much mistrust and all of these other things going on within us because of all these things that have happened in our lives that we can't trust and all these things that have happened that are painful and we don't want to re-experience that pain again in another situation. And all the people that have misled us down all of these different roads that we're sick and tired of travelling down because they didn't work either and this didn't work either and that. And so in the end, we get ourselves into this state where we're so resistive to truth because who knows? We well, don't know if it's truth yet or not. Right? The key thing, obviously, is get that relationship with God going. Feel the flow of love with God coming through you. Then you will know what is truth and what is not just by that relationship. And you won't need a book. You will not need anything other than that flow, trusting that flow. And when it disconnects, I know I'm not there. I know there's something going on in me. I know that something's going on in me that I'm rejecting. And then it's just a matter of, am I willing to face it or do I want to stay in my addiction? Do I want to stay in this place where I'm addicted to getting this certain thing from somebody or not seeing this particular emotion? Or whatever? AJ, would you please talk about grace? Yeah. Just hang on a sec. I was just... I Mike, I had a question uh, related to this subject that we were just discussing. I had a couple. Yeah. The, the process of emotional release that you've described, we will receive the divine love if we also have a desire for God's love. But we can go through the process and not receive God's love. Certainly. Because, because receiving God's love is just about having a pure desire for it, a longing for it. So I, if I decide I'm going to work through all of my emotional issues, but I'm not going to do it with God, I'm going to do it by myself, we can do that. And that's what the majority of people who are self-reliant do in the end. They work through their emotions uh, without, without receiving God's love because they don't want to have a relationship with God. They don't believe even that maybe the personal relationship with God is possible. So the truth is that you can work through all of your emotions and get to a state of clarity with all of your emotions without God. It's going to take you a lot longer to do it. Why would you want to? Why would you want to? Yeah. <laughs> This may dovetail with Joni's question, but the, the, the Course in Miracles is a channel material that talks about forgiveness. And I'm wondering, does that, does that process go deep enough that they use? Um, the Course in Miracles were, was channeled material from a second sphere spirit who is now on the Divine Love Path. So the second sphere spirit, when they channeled the material, the Course in Miracles, they were not on the Divine Love Path, they were on the Natural Love Path. They, they came from a Christian point of view when they were on earth and then they modified those viewpoints based on their experiences in the first and second sphere in the spirit world. And then because of their interest in helping people on earth, they channeled the material through, <coughs> through the, the human channelers. The human channelers too had some filters, emotional filters regarding the material as well. And so it worked perfectly, if you like, to channel exactly what the Course in Miracles finished up being. The Course in Miracles doesn't address a lot of issues emotionally. It addresses many of them from an intellectual perspective because of the background of the Spirit giving the material. And, and now that Spirit is on the Divine Love Path, the Spirit is aware of what it would like to do to change all of those things, but the people who channel the original material are not in the condition where they can accept the changes that the Spirit would like to make. 
So there are truths in the Course in Miracles, just like there are truths in all other channel material. Um, and certainly there's no need to avoid any channel material. You'll soon see when you're connected with God what's truth and what isn't. But you'll find in the Course of, Miku in the course of uh, Miracles that a lot of it is conundrum upon conundrum. Um, and the reason why is because a lot of times there was confusion, emotional confusion in the spirit while the material was being channeled. And that's why a lot of it sort of has, it has smatterings of beauty and in the other, on the other side it has smatterings of like, almost like a drug-induced rant, ranting. Um, and you will be able to see the difference as you actually read the course through the entire process. Anything that complicates your progression towards God is obviously just going to make your progression towards God longer. And the course in Miriam, like, the truth is that there are just two things that you need to do to progress towards God. Have a longing for God's love and truth and feel your emotions. All of them, every single moment of every single day. But no, don't do the book clubs anymore, just kind of throw them out. Well, you can do as many book clubs as you want. You've got free will to say. Well, what you're saying answer. though is that the built-in equipment that we have is really adequate. Exactly. We have Why, like, don't you think God would have provided you with everything you need to connect to her? Why do you think you need anything else? Like, everything you need to connect to God has already been given you, inside of you. Why would you need to go and buy a book to help you do it? Now, sure, these books are handy and they can help you connect with your emotions and everything else, but in the end, God's already given you absolutely everything you need inside of yourself to connect to Him. Along these lines, and one of the things that troubles me <coughs> is the pageant messages themselves. Because it seems to me that over the years, I mean, they were channeled back, in, they ended back in 1920. Mm -hmm. They were never published until 40 or somewhere around there, and then finally ordered 58 or something. And there's such a stumbling block for it. Because it becomes for some people like a new Bible. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But the reason why it becomes for, like, for people like a new Bible is because people are constantly looking for their being, like, there's this perspective of truth that everyone has is that, is that oh, I've found the truth mm -hmm. and there is never anything going mm -hmm. to be beyond this truth. Mm -hmm. And that is certainly not the truth. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. Obviously, if there's an infinite God and an infinite universe, there must be an infinite amount of truth. And therefore, for me or anybody to state right at this moment that you know it all, you are straight away in error. Yeah. Right? As soon as you say you know it all, you are straight away in error because there's no way you know it all. There's only one being in the universe that knows it all, and that was the creator of it all. Mm -hmm. and, and so, in the end, we need to come to see the qualities of truth, and one of the qualities of truth, and that's why I wrote that material on the qualities of truth. One of the qualities of truth is that truth is infinite. So if you get involved with any form of religion or any form of worship or any form of New Age doctrine or all these other things where they say that, they, that this is the entire truth and there is nothing above it, straight away understand that they do not understand one of the qualities of truth. Mm -hmm. And that is that the truth continues to be infinite. It sounds like a a living relationship that you're yeah. that you're bringing That's right. to us. Yeah. And there are many paths, right? Sorry. There are many paths. And there are not many paths. No. Don't confuse many paths with what I've just said. There is one path, but it is the, path, the there's one path to God, and that is the path God created to God. All other paths are just man's paths to God. What they think are paths to God. And some of them lead you closer to God because obviously many men have come up with some pretty good ideas. And so they do certainly lead you closer to God. But in the end, if you want to be at one with God, the only path you will be able to accept in the end is God's design for you. And without Diet Coke? Well, unfortunately, <laughs> it doesn't include Diet Coke. No. Yeah. Um, and, and honestly, it doesn't include a lot of other things too. And there's a lot of things in our lives that we currently have today 
that you'll find that you'll naturally feel mm -hmm. like you don't need anymore as a, as a part of that path. But bear in mind that God designed it. All these other so-called paths are just paths that man designed. And honestly, there are literally six and something billion paths at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Because almost every person on earth <laughs> believes that what they're doing happens to be the right path. There are over 5,000 denominations of Christianity. Exactly. Yeah. 35. Yeah. yeah. 35,000. Yeah, yeah it's, it's amazing. And so, like, the key thing to remember is that God designed a path for you to follow to God. Now, you will discover and be on that path when you start connecting to God and receiving divine love and trusting the truth that flows as a result of that connection. All I'm doing is just telling you the truth about it, that's all. And But a person can follow as many paths as they want. Eventually they'll come to see that there is in fact only one absolute truth, and that is God's. But what I know about that absolute truth at the moment is relative and will continue to grow. And what you know about that absolute truth at the moment is relative and will continue to grow. We don't know <laughs> the full truth about what God has done. But we do know, and there you is... You don't know? No, nobody knows. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows the full truth of anything that God has done. At the moment. Now, I don't know it's because one reason is he's not finished doing it yet. Well, well, of course, that's one reason. But not only that, he, what he's done is infinite. And when you start contemplating from an emotional perspective what infinity really means, you'll start seeing that it's impossible to say that I know the absolute truth. All I know is relative to what other people know, really. And rel very much relative in terms of a very small part of what God knows. Right? Now obviously there will be people on earth who know more of that absolute truth than others. Mm -hmm. Just like there are people on earth who know more about engineering than others and people know more about science than others and people know more about quantum physics than others do and more people know more about emotions than others do and so forth. But that's a natural part of our life. God created that in fact because God enjoys the fact that we all have unique abilities. That's why he created you. You all have a unique abilities that you will discover. Right? And there are some people who have a unique ability to harmonise with truth. Right? That's a part of their soul. And you can trust those people perhaps in your relationship with God. Try out, try what they say to you out and see whether it helps your connection. If it doesn't, then it obviously doesn't. Has anyone ever seen God? And the only way to see God is soul to soul for a start. So um, the, the spirits in the 22nd sphere of development would say, yes, we, we see God, but not in the sense that you're conceiving it to be. Uh, but like me seeing you, it's, it's a totally different kind of communication. Yeah, but when you think about it, you don't really see me. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta, you gotta relate on a rational basis, I guess. But well, well, let's look at it rationally. Do you know what emotions I'm feeling right now? Um, can, you, can you feel all of my emotions right now? No, I can. I can assume. I can. Um, I can. But that's not. I can extrapolate. I can. You know, I can talk to you for a while and you know, do the 15 minute read. Yeah, sure. You know, you, there, there are games you can play to get that. I was a salesman for but 20 years. But it still doesn't mean yeah. that you know me. Yeah, of course not. So how do you actually know of it? By experience. By feeling them, isn't it? By actually yeah. feeling the emotions flowing back and forth between you and them. And to be honest, this is exactly the same way that you will come to know God in that same way. The fear by feeling the emotions flowing back and forth. This outer shell means nothing to our interaction. It's the emotions that flow between us that mean everything. And it's the same with our relationship with God. It's the emotions that flow between myself and God that means everything. What, what is the time, by the way? It's about 3.30. 4.20. No, 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 no. It's about 1 o'clock. You get five minutes. You get five minutes. <laughs> it, it is 4.20. 4.20. It is 4.20. <laughs> so we're trying to fit the minutes in. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's four twenty. Twenty. <laughs> you try to keep me away no, from the song? No, we can't. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Don't lie to God. Ten minutes of grace. <laughs> well, what we've been <laughs> talking about is grace, really. The, the flow, divine love is grace. Um, but I suppose the way we think of grace is more to do with forgiveness a lot, isn't it, too? Like, so perhaps I could talk about a little bit about what divine forgiveness really is. And it relates to the law, what's called the law of compensation or the law of karma, of what people know today. And when you do something that harms another person in love, so in other words, you take an action that harms somebody else and it was an unloving action. Now, whether you've done it intentionally or unintentionally, we won't worry ourselves about it at this moment. If you've done it intentionally, there will be a different effect on your soul than if you've done it unintentionally. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so we won't be too concerned about that. There is different degrees of what's happening. It, so we could do the same action. So for example, a man could kill another man, but one man killing the other man, it might be an accident. Another one, it might be uh, you know, out of a fit of rage, and then the other one might have been really planned and well conceived, and then he did it. And all of those different things obviously have different degrees of soul damage to the person carrying out the act. But every one of those actions creates some soul damage inside of my own soul that I will at some point need to feel in the future. And the law of compensation says uh, that every single thing that I've ever created harmful to anything around me I will have to actually feel. When you think about that, that's quite a scary proposition. Yeah. Yes, it is. Isn't it? So that means every time you've harmed one of your children, whether it was unintentional or intentional, there's different degrees of soul damage that you did to them, and therefore also soul damage that you've done to yourself. And the law of compensation will require a payment, basically, of that. It will require you to feel that damage that you did to the person at some point in the future. Now, of course, obviously, if I've done a lot of damage to lots of different people, like someone like Hitler or something like that, or you know, I've been involved in war and killing and murdering people or whatever, then obviously there's quite a lot of soul damage, isn't there, that I'm going to have to work my way through from those, from those choices and decisions. Now, you can see why a lot of spirits then would pass, people would pass in the spirit world and spend hundreds or even thousands of years dealing with each of these emotions. Right? And uh, this is one thing I'd just like to mention as a side point. In the book Postmortem Journal, where D.H. Lawrence, where, where uh, Lawrence of Arabia's um, experience was, he actually mentioned going through the law of compensation with a, with a man that he murdered. And, and what what he actually went through emotionally in that book. So it's a very interesting read from the Law of Compensation point of view. So that was just an aside. Now, the Law of Compensation um, is a law that you will have to work your way through on the natural love path. In other words, you cannot get to the sixth sphere of the spirit world without going through every single thing and compensating for every single thing that you did unlovingly when you were on earth or in the spirit world when you first arrive, because a lot still continue unloving actions when they first pass. Now, the law of divine love, which you could also call the law of grace, um, does something that enables the law of compensation to not operate upon the soul. And what it does is that the law of grace, or the law of divine love, is that if you have a sincere repentance in your heart and remorse for the things that you've done, and you have a preparedness to experience the emotion of all of that truth of what you've done and what it created, and you direct that remorse and, and feelings towards God, then God's love can actually enter you and help you, and it removes the causes, it removes the reasons why you did those things from you as long as you have that emotional openness to, to actually go through that experience. Now that is going to mean that for very short and intense periods of time you are going to experience some very short but very intense emotions. 
because of that being willing to actually go into that state of remorse. And the remorse can't be fate. You can't say, oh, I'm sorry, God, because I did that, I did this, I did that. It's going to have to be felt. Right? It's going to have to be sincerely felt inside of your heart. But when it does, it activates this law of love between yourself and God. The law of divine forgiveness is activated. And God's love comes and actually does remove <coughs> the underlying causes so that the law of compensation doesn't act anymore upon the soul. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. so, so if you enter this relationship with God, you can progress in a year on earth here through all of these emotions and also through all of the things that you created that were harmful to others and get into a state of near at one moment or at one moment with God in that space of time that if you just did it through the, through the natural love law of compensation process you would spend hundreds or even thousands of years working your way through some of these issues depending on your willingness to actually experience the emotion. So my suggestion <laughs> is to really sincerely get onto the divine love path and let yourself sincerely work through not just the things that others have done to you because often that's the group of emotions we're very comfortable dealing with so oh yeah my dad did this and my mum did that and my brother did this and my sister did that and my boss did that to me all these stuff done to me we're really comfortable with dealing with all of that when I say comfortable we at least can face a lot of those things emotionally without too much problem. The thing usually that we have the most discomfort with is the negative things and unloving things we've done to ourselves and the unloving things and negative things that we've done to others. They are the two areas that we find that it's a lot harder to work through emotionally with. Thank you. It is accelerating the whole this whole process is accelerating the energies are being downloaded at a tremendous rate. The divine love. That's right. That's right. The more truth you face about divine love and how it all works, and the more truth you even hear, the more will actually flow through you as well. And this is why even discussions like this, you can go away for months and process lots and lots of different things just from an, having an awakening about certain things that are triggering and awakening in you right now. So even just talking about these things and understanding them more does help the entire emotional process. And you'll find that um, you, you will have big shifts emotionally if you allow that process to just continue. But it's been, it's been excellent. I think we need to finish there. It's been, it's been excellent um, being able to meet all of you again. And, and and seeing how some of you have really right, taken a hold of the emotional process and that connection with God and really run with it too, that's really really wonderful to see. And uh, I'm not sure when I'm going to be back, but uh, I hope by by you know I'm hoping that by the next time I'm back I might be able to teleport back. But we'll see. <laughs> but it just depends a lot on uh, on my own condition of what I've got to work through yet. And just like you, sometimes I don't know what I've got to work through next either. Uh, and it's not until the law of attraction makes it aware to me that I see what I've got to work through. Thank you for coming. Yes, thank you. You know, one of the things that I didn't really bring up, but one of my issues is I, I lived with a guy that I thought he was Jesus. Um, we lived together for two years. Got into a lot of trouble, you know, and, and really... Uh, um, I think you being here helped me help heal some of that, you know, because now, because you're different than he was. Hopefully. Different Jesus, huh? Different Jesus. But I, it was very, it was very beneficial to me, I thank you. A lot, of, a lot of people feel that when I say I'm Jesus, that it means that I'm saying that I'm better than you. Some and, people think that that yeah, way, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's not the case at all, that's not what I, certainly not what I feel. Um, I just know who I am, that's all. and I can remember the events in my life, right? So, and I don't mean just my life now, I mean my life for the last 2,000 years. So, and obviously there's a lot I could talk about about all of that. But, the, you know, I, I do understand why people have so much trouble, and, and I don't blame them either. 
because um, I don't know how I would respond if, if, if I was in your position. Um, obviously, you don't know what I remember. Does that make sense? Like, I don't yeah. know what you remember. Yeah, it's like, it's like trying to live through somebody else's shoes. You just yeah. really can't sometimes, no, you know. No. And, and, and the only thing that's going to prove the truth of what I'm saying to you on that subject or not is, is time. You'll soon see. You'll soon see. You know, like, I, I've told you quite clearly that I'm not in the condition of a one who's got it right now. And I know that I will not be for, for a little bit more time at least because of the emotions I know that I'm still working through. But, but that doesn't change my memory or anything like that. But obviously it does change people's perception of me and what they believe I should be on their expectations of what I should be. And I understand all of that. But in time you will see that what I'm saying on that subject is true to as well. Yeah. Having you here and, and having you actually around during this particular time in history um, challenges, you know, I mean, it's, it challenges every Christian out there that believes, <laughs> that believes in the doctrine of, you know, you, you know that forgiveness of sins and all that, that whole thing, you know. In the blood um, of Jesus. So there's an opportunity for people to see the truth in all of that. You know, it puts you at great risk yeah. to do that. You know, and almost maybe I shouldn't say this again, but it puts people that are around you at great risk too. Sometimes. You know, I mean, probably in much the same way, if not even worse, than it was in the first century. Um, yeah. See, I I have a much more positive view yeah. than that. Um, well, it's not about attitude, it's about truth, okay? Well, no, I feel, I feel the truth is that mankind is much more ready to truth now than they've ever been. And I also feel that mankind is so sick and tired of being in a state of hatred and unfortunate that, that now people are ready, ready, are much more ready for change. But I do agree that obviously, you know, I've had lots of quite strong, violent reactions already. So, so I, so I do agree that it is, you know, that there is obviously going to be some emotions people can work through. The beauty, though, of being in a condition of abundance is that once you're in that condition, and I, and I'm not going to be too public, openly public about everything until I'm in that condition. But once you're in that condition, there's just so much that you can achieve in that condition. To, to protect yourself as well and to keep away from negative situations. Being here and being there. Yeah, and you're much more sensitive to the laws of attraction and what's going on as well. So, you, you know, you, won't, you don't even finish up attracting a lot of the events because you're not even in the location where they occur. So, yeah, there's a lot of things that can occur that, are quite, that can protect you. And so, yeah, I know I've got a lot of confidence about all of those things now. I didn't have, you know, five years ago when I had all my fears to work through. But, uh, but now, it has been so, so, so. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> I think that's been worth it to, to come from Arizona to engage the law of land. <laughs> yeah. okay. Do I? How Joseph finished up uh, getting here was that his hot water service broke down, and then he realised that perhaps he wasn't spending much money on his soul. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. <laughs> yeah. So he decided to fly here and, uh, and visit us. Yeah. Mm -hmm.